Aguari. I throw, you catch. It's not that hard, okay? All right, get the out of here. We're going to talk a lot about drills and fundamentals. Watch it, watch it, watch it, watch it. On 93.5. Watch it. And 107.5. Boom, baby. The Fan. So with that result last night, does that mean the Reds are going to host in the World Series? That's right. Yep. No. Oh, we don't do that anymore, Mark, in the All-Star game? No, they stopped doing that. <laughs> We're partying like it's 2008. Hell yeah. The NL wins their first All-Star game since 2012. I kind of forgot the drought had been that long, again, since we've abandoned, and I'm very grateful, I think, that we have, since we've abandoned the whole, we're playing for home field in the World Series in the All-Star game. I don't think anyone cares who wins, NL or AL. Uh, but last night, it was uh, in the eighth inning, bottom, or t- top of the eighth, I guess, uh, Elias Diaz with a go-ahead two-run shot, 3-2, the NL holds Former on. Indianapolis Indian. To win. Really? Yes. Cool story, 32-year-old, first All-Star game. Rockies catcher. I'm curious of this, Kevin, as as you were watching it, and I did think of this. I guess there are probably two different answers. But the first would be, what player or moment do you most think of when you think of the All-Star game? And what player or moment do you first recall seeing live? Well, for myself, I I would probably speak more to home run derbies than the All Star game. If I had to pick an All Star moment, though, I would say Tory Hunter robbing Barry Bonds in whatever that All Star game would okay. have been. For some reason, Milwaukee as a ballpark is sticking out to me. Does that sound right? I think when that occurred, I remember Bonds then remember picked him up as he was running back out to be in That's the outfield right. for the next inning. and I mean, it's, you know, vintage Troy Hunter. Uh, so that would be the one all-star game moment that pops in my head when you first ask that. For me, Dave Parker's throw from right field, but I don't recall if I saw that live or I just remember seeing it like on a replay. But I watched live when Fred Lynn hit the first Grand Slam in all-star game history, who's like the last player you would expect to hit a Grand Slam. And then Bo Jackson's home run when Ronald Reagan was in the booth would be the moments that like that I most remember. Elias Diaz will probably be on that list at some point. You know, it's interesting because so many – and I'm hesitant to say this because I, I, I don't want to sound like I'm being irresponsible of the craft that we are fortunate enough to, to have and do. But it did feel to me like – a high percentage of the players that were out there, I was like, I don't know who this guy is. Well, I I saw your tweet last night, Jake, and I, I think you and I both agree on the on both of those thoughts of the NCAA tournament needs to go back to the floors that actually indicate where the city is and where the home floor, if you will, is and not have a corporate feel to every single home floor in the tournament. And then I just... I feel like from a marketing standpoint, I think we all can agree on this. Major League Baseball's got a marketing problem right now. Unbelievable. And, and I know exactly where you're going. And I'm a, So wear the jersey of the team you play for. It's crazy. I, well, and where is the Elias Diaz jersey sales really going to be that high that would overrule the marketing potential of, oh, wow, there's that Rockies guy that just hit the home correct. run. So then in the second half of the season when you're watching the Rockies, you're like, I wonder what that All-Star's doing for them. Totally. Totally well, those agree. jerseys look way too similar. No, the jerseys too. Awesome. I was like green and blue. I'm like, oh, okay. It was okay. So it was hard to tell. Was that a Seattle thing they were doing? Yeah, I think that's jerseys? what it was supposed okay. to be. But well, here's the other thing. Uh, a couple of things in play here. Number one, I realized that you had everybody wearing the uniform of their team. So it's like, no, no, no. For this game, they are the American League. Okay, I get it. But as a kid, for example, I always thought it was so cool. Like when I played Little League Baseball at the Allisonville Little League and we had the All-Star team at the end of the year, the Allisonville All-Stars that went and played Randsburg and Eagledale and Haverford, I I thought it was cool that, you know, I thought of it as as everybody all coming together. You know, Andy Burt was an Oriole, but now he's on the All-Star team. Matt Church was a twin, but he's on the All-Star team. And in that case, with the the Major League Baseball All-Star Game, I think there is something for even for kids to be able to see a Philadelphia Philly throwing an assist to second base to a Chicago Cub. 
shows that like in that moment, like, oh, there are different teams, but they're coming together. There's there's a, an element of that for kids, number one. But number two, and more importantly, just when guys were at the plate, especially because the batting helmets that they had were were just A or N, and I'm like, well, who? Okay, so who are we looking at here? It, it, it took me like till the fourth inning before I realized that in the field they had on their hats or the logo of their hats, right? But that's the one thing that I most miss was seeing – there, and there's something about seeing your team represented, right? Somebody pointed out um, Hoosier says Ted Williams in Boston. That's, that's a, certainly a, a huge all-star memory. That's the that... game – the Ted Williams <clears throat> game in Boston was one – I was so fascinated by this. Um, Ted Williams came out on the field – and I know I've told you guys this before, and he had all the players crowd around him. And he pulled in McGuire and said something, and McGuire got, like, super excited and said yes, and Williams got, like, super excited that McGuire said, and I'm like, what happened there? So I asked McGuire once when I worked in St. Louis, I said, what did Ted Williams ask you? He had all these players crowded around him, and the, the two players that he wanted to talk to, he wanted to talk to Tony Gwynn, and he pulled in McGuire. And then he asked the players, do any of you, when you hit a foul ball, smell the smoke? And McGuire was the one player that was like, I think he said, do you ever smell the smoke? And McGuire's the one that said, oh my gosh, on a foul ball, the smoke of the burn of the the, the bat and the, and the ball burning each other? And Ted Williams lights up like a Christmas tree and is like, yes! And McGuire, when I asked McGuire about it, he said, Ted Williams went crazy over the fact that I confirmed that I had smelled that and then later sought him out like after the game and said, I, I've i asked that forever and I've never had another player say they, they knew what I was talking about. Hmm. And, he, and I thought that was super cool. And that was the, the same year I asked McGuire that at training camp or spring training. And later that spring training, I was on one of the diamonds and McGuire was taking batting practice and he'd hit a home run, and I went and picked it up. And and the, I kid you not, I still have it. The ball was burnt. You could see a burn mark on the ball. Hmm. I always thought that was cool. Um, but yeah, the Williams moment is probably the most iconic yeah, in terms yeah. of his pregame stuff. Certainly. A uh, good Wednesday morning to you. He is Jake Quarry. I'm Kevin Bowen. Mark Dykton with us as always. We'll talk a little baseball coming up, uh, especially in the nine o'clock hour. Will Carroll going to join us again? Not getting back to play until Friday for Major League Baseball. Uh, but really, five of the six divisions extremely close heading into the second half of the season. We have not had had that in quite some time in Major League Baseball. So we will talk a little baseball coming up at nine. Uh, the Pacers back in action for their summer league. That is tonight. It is a seven thirty tip. Uh, the veterans officially are done for summer leagues. That would be Benedict Mather and Andrew Nemhart, Isaiah Jackson. Uh, do we get a look tonight, though, at the uh, Chet Holmgren experience for the Pacers? Boy, I'll tell you what. I'm a long time coming, right? If you are, can you imagine the conversations that take place in Oklahoma City radio? Which, by the way, only two spots ahead of where we are in the mid market morning rankings. That's do we, humbling. Do we know the name of the show in Oklahoma City, the morning show? Well, Mark? I can sure find out. Um, you know, I'm guessing it's Boomer and Sooner early in the morning, something like that. Sooner in the poke, probably, if they want to cover both bases. How long have they been talking about Chet Holmgren and the anticipation? Of, I think he's had a good summer league. For what it's worth. And we kind of forget about him, right? Well, I'm sure down there they well, do not. But yeah, yeah, but I'm saying, like, for all the talk about Victor Wimamyama, I mean, Holmgren is a similar type player at his size and his ability. And, you know, he's been been a great player, obviously, for the one year of college, but a, high, but a major star in high school. Yeah, I know he hasn't played it in the full summer league schedule, understandable, given his injury situation, but... We'll see if Holmgren gives it a go against the Pacers tonight. Oklahoma but. City uh, Sports Talk, by the way, 94.7, the ref, and it's uh, T. Row in the morning show. The ref? ref? Toby Rowland, yeah. Keep rolling, rolling, rolling. Oh, that's Perfect. right. Yeah, Perfect Papa Roach, like right Kevin there. likes to think. Gosh, I'd love to make an appearance on that show. Uh, Jake, I saw the uh, IMS Museum's going to shut it down for about a year ish. You, you, you're plus to do yeah, some serious and I'm, renovations. I'm happy to hear this. Eighty nine million dollar renovation. I think a lot of people don't grasp this. The Indianapolis Motor Speedway Museum is separate from the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. It is 
its own entity. It leases essentially the building on the property of the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, but it, it is not under the financial umbrella of the Penske Entertainment Group and the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. So it's much more self-sufficient than that. If you have been to what I believe is the creme de la creme of motorsports museums, the Barber Motorsports Park in Birmingham, Alabama, just outside Birmingham, when you walk in, that is a six-story, they have like a circular ramp in the middle of it, kind of like what you would see at the Children's Museum with the largest collection of motorcycles and the largest collection of Lotus race cars in the world in, under one roof. And it is state-of-the-art. Everything is fabulous. It, it is, you can eat off the floor in that place. And I always felt like that's what the Speedway Museum needed to be in terms of its innovation. You, you know, the Indianapolis Motor Speedway Hall of Fame Museum, which I'm obviously a fan and supporter of. I'm one of the voters for their Hall of Fame, for that matter, and I'm very proud of that, very flattered by it. I take it very seriously. The But the inside of it needed a facelift, for sure. It needed to be modernized because I think people go in there, and the basement tour is fa- you know, fantastic, but now you're going to talk about like you know kind of two layers and uh, an interactive on the ceiling via whatever you want to call it video or you know the, the likeness of flyovers and I just think that for a place where cars were going 100 miles an hour 120 years ago the more more interactive things for kids kind of just a facelift not only in look but also just in presentation and I think people will be blown away by it and it's going to be 2 years in the making, but I think when it opens, it's going to be pretty darn special. Yeah, closing this November through April 2025, so that is a long time. $89 million obviously, is a huge chunk of change. That is funded by donations. They said that they've had $46 million of that secured, 20 of it coming from the Lilly Endowment. Uh, but yeah, seven permanent exhibits. There'll be a racing simulator in there. So some serious renovation work coming to the IMS Museum. Uh, here starting late, late this fall. By and the total way, Oklahoma City also has another sports channel, and it's the called Ump? The Morning Animals on WWLS. Ow! Yeah, that's what they do. Sounds pretty wild, I said. Wow. Mark, that seems like I mean, right up your alley with all there, your animal sounds. Is there anything more stereotypical? Like, literally, if you were doing a... If this were a, a comedy... First off, if this if if our show was a movie, a comedy movie about about morning radio, what actor plays each of us? I know who plays you, Mark. Oh, well, I can't wait to hear who that, that's going to well, be. Well, I don't know the guy's name. Oh. But but what's the meme that's, of the hell of a way to get into the story. There's a meme from from the show Always Sunny in Philadelphia of the guy that's doing this. Oh, Charlie Day. Okay, I'll there you go. That. That, I'll that's take you. that one. That's you. Um I'm only going by, and I am not saying that I agree with this in any way, shape, or form, but in the way that I speak, and oftentimes, like, if I'm around a group of people, I guess just, I think it's just strictly my height. People tell me, and I don't think I look like him, but people say Vince Vaughn for me in mannerism. That's a humble nod by you. I, I don't I don't agree with it, but people tell me, the way I speak, it has nothing to do, I mean, Vince Vaughn is a far more handsome and cool guy than I. I, I understand that. I've met both. That would be accurate. Excuse me? I met Vince Vaughn before. Well, you're thinking he's a more handsome guy than I? Well, hey. This was also back in like 2005. Would you agree or disagree with Vince Vaughn playing my role? Uh, You're more of a John Malkovich, I would say. I don't remember anything about John Malkovich. (laughs) People have labeled a Honey, I Shrunk the Kids guy for myself. Oh, Rick Moranis? Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's pretty accurate. Really? I thought that's Matt Glenn. Well, when you you have your, your Twitter profile pictures from like, Ten years ago, that is. Accurate. I changed it. Finally, yeah, got a little bit more modern. Call me the Colts. Gotten a little bit more modern. You like the Speedway Museum? Yeah. You finally decided to, to update. I but but I would think that if you were to make a movie about a morning sports talk show, you would have like Seth Rogen and Michael Sarah and like Jonah Hill, and it would be called the the Morning Animals. <laughs> yeah, and it would be. <laughs> <laughs> We haven't heard the bobcat yet. Like, why don't, why don't we just call it the zoo? The morning zoo. And I haven't heard Howard Dean yet, Mark. 
<laughs> that's actually a guy named Bob. That's beautiful. <laughs> that's, that is beautiful. That's what I would assume the sports animal sounds like in Oklahoma City this morning. <laughs> you uh, you catch any of Tyrese Halliburton on Paul George's podcast? I did. Any uh, any thoughts? Um, it, it it's interesting because first off. My first thought on it was Paul George is doing this podcast and it has a pretty big reach and he looks kind of in control in it. It's very clear that he's the straw mixing the drink. And I mean this not as a bad, almost as a compliment to Paul George. And I thought to myself, that's why he's in Los Angeles. That was actually my thought. I I mean, in terms of above and beyond the content, I know that's not what you were asking, but... Paul George is a guy that those are the kinds of things that he wants to do. Not not like doing a podcast is some big hard thing, but but that kind of a thing is he is the alpha in that situation. I thought Halliburton Halliburton I can't be the only one that thought to myself this is kind of, this is cool for sure and it shows that he is a player that it shows the camaraderie amongst the NBA, but also there are probably some people that are like, okay, that's really cool, but like, let's kind of leave that. His hanging out with Paul George in L.A. needs to be limited to this. Sounds like it's not. It sounds like they are very close. Yeah, that they text all the time. Uh, you know, Tyrese has mentioned. You know, when he got traded here, he's asked Paul a lot of things about the franchise, and Paul admitted throughout the podcast that you know, obviously, it's been several years since Paul's been here, but Paul had a lot, a lot of positive things to say about his time here in Indiana. And specifically, I think both of them were kind of like, love the training staff, love the structure of the Pacers franchise. And again, Paul threw out the, I get that Rick Carlisle wasn't my coach, but Tyrese is like, oh no, it is still the same way. Like they're, I mean, if you are, if you're showing up late, you're getting fined. And Tyrese is like, I get fined a ton. And, you know, Paul and him kind of had some back and forth and just stories like that. Um, so they are really close, and and I think that was very apparent. I think it was a good listen. I, I don't. Yeah, it was. And, and I will raise my hand and say I'm not one of these people that have like PTSD over Paul George's situation and think that Tyrese Halliburton is going to fall into the same boat. So maybe I can kind of separate myself. Well, from I think that. now that's obviously the case, but but I can see if this had been done a year ago, I think people would have a far different reaction to it. Yeah, I, I would encourage Pacers fans to give it a listen. Uh, I, th- I thought it was enjoyable. There's a lot of non-Indiana talk as well, just kind of about them as basketball players, you know, what they... I, I thought it was a fun back and forth they had about like what their big weaknesses are, like what they just cannot do on the basketball floor. I, I enjoyed hearing that from, obviously, two all-star uh, talents there. Um, and there's a great Larry Bird story in there from, from Paul George. Uh, which I think people will will appreciate well. Then he referenced, um, I assume it was Billy Keller. He referenced on Billy Keller. Or he, he called him Billy, Pacers shooting coach Billy. Would that have been, been Billy Keller back in the day? Depends on when he's talking about. He said early, like rookie rookie second year, uh, but he really credited Billy, and again, I assume that, it was I would Billy assume Keller. Billy Keller, yeah. He really credited him for helping him kind of reshape his jump shot and getting it Although to be it more of been. a... Um, there was a, a coach they had, gosh, what was his name, whose father, a younger guy whose father had been a coach. I got was, the impression when he was saying coach, it was kind of like consultant. Yeah, that would be, I would assume that you are correct in that. Uh, he was talking about the Brandon Rush trade was one of the more kind of early on emotional moments for him in the NBA of like, oh, wow, this is a business. And in a way, I mean, Halliburton, of course, Faced it firsthand and him being traded not even a second year into the NBA by being traded from Sacramento to Indiana, but I thought it was a good listen. You know, the I like Paul George. I liked him when he was here, I, and I I never had a problem with – I personally felt like, you know, people that thought that he railroaded the franchise, I'm like, I, did he? I mean, he basically said – he. I don't think anybody was stunned that he left, and he gave them the opportunity to trade him as opposed to just signing as a free agent, and – I also go back to, I, I thought, not to rehash old wounds or tear open old scabs, but the Larry Bird comment of, Paul, don't make the decisions around here. I, you just don't say that to today's modern NBA Kevin player. Pritchard's not making that mistake. Right. He That's exactly right. He's not going to make that mistake with Halliburton. He has made that very clear, and Tyrese has mentioned that 
on many occasions how involved he feels like he is with decision making might be too much of a term, but certainly the thought process. And you know what? Watch Tyrese Halliburton play basketball. I think he knows what he's doing. I, I, I would think, probably like to try and get his insight into how he views players. And again, he made this very clear to Paul George. He's like, I am a basketball junkie. He's like, I've got Woj notifications, Shams notifications on my phone. I am obsessed with it. Just listening to them talk about the league. This is a guy that, you know, Miles Turner strikes me as a guy, Jake, when the offseason arrives, he wants to get away, really get away. Tyrese strikes me as a guy that's just not that. He he is yes he he wants to spend time with his family et cetera and, and do a little bit of travel, but he's still pretty plugged into what's going on around the league. You know, Kevin Pritchard, if you really look at his time as a basketball executive, maybe now people have forgotten about this and it's been water under the bridge. But if you were to ask people in Portland about Kevin Pritchard, he's the guy that took Greg Oden over Kevin Durant. And he is the guy that was fortunate enough to have the opportunity to take Greg Oden over Kevin Durant because every general manager in the NBA would have taken Greg Oden over Kevin Durant, period. And in hindsight, obviously, it did not work out. I have always wondered whether or not Greg Oden, if he had stayed healthy, would have delayed the movement to which basketball was headed. And would he have been, would Greg Oden have forced teams to come up with a way to counter what he was doing on the block? Or would he have been somebody that would Oden have been playing catch up with the pace of today's game? We'll never know that. But when Greg Oden was in Portland, I think it's now well documented the injuries led to a depression, which led to alcohol, which led to a lot of things that, and kudos to Greg Oden for having fought back from all of that, but he went into very dark places. And I think that Kevin Pritchard, as a result of that, from an executive position, has always struggled with the dichotomy of making sure that you are assessing, evaluating, and providing for your players as a person and being patient with them even when it may not be the best interest in your franchise or what your franchise needs. And then in addition to that, you have to then worry about, if you are Kevin Pritchard, at some point you've got to get guys on the floor for the sake of the others, there is a balancing act between the person, the player, trusting the player too much. I think he was I think Kevin Pritchard really was hurt by Oladipo. And so I think that's why the Halliburton signing was so important for Kevin Pritchard, probably psychologically as much as anything, because it showed A that a franchise player is willing to marry with him. B that his his work and what he had learned in dealing with Odin Halliburton hasn't had off court issues obviously, but but what he learned in building with Odin, what he learned in trusting or not trusting Oladipo and Paul George, he I think he handled it differently with Halliburton than he did the other three guys in in just different scenarios, and it has worked out well. And you hope as a Pacer fan that it continues to be that way for five years because you have right now what looks to be the beginning of a very exciting movie. Share some Miles Turner comments here in a bit uh, that I think are pretty encouraging about a new Pacers edition that kind of falls in line to uh, something I was trying to point out late last week. Uh, so we'll do that a little bit later today. Again, tonight it'll be the Pacers back in action, Summer League-wise, 7.30 with the Oklahoma City Thunder you guys see uh, today is also the debut of the new Peyton Manning Netflix series? Yeah. Quarterback? Yeah, I, I'm going to be all, all over this. Same here. Uh, so for those unfamiliar, this is via Omaha Productions, of course, Peyton's um, you know, production uh, company. Uh, it, an awesome trailer f- floating around out there if you want to see that. Uh, but basically, they followed Patrick Mahomes... Kirk Cousins and Marcus Mariota throughout the entire NFL season last year. 
and whatever you want to call it, a hard knocks feel to how three of those guys went about their respective seasons. And I love the variety of all three of them. Um, you know, selfishly, maybe I would have liked one of them to be kind of a really, really young quarterback, but I understand the hesitancy by a young quarterback signing off on that. But clearly, Mahomes wins a Super Bowl. Cousins' season has some super highs, and then they bow out early. Mariota gets benched the week his wife was having a child. Um, so I just think the quarterback position is such a fascinating one in the NFL to get some behind the scenes access into these three guys and their lives and how they go about, you know, preparing each week family life, home life, uh, personal life, obviously football life. Really looking forward to it. I always felt Marcus Mariota, having nothing to do with him as a player, Kevin, I have no idea why I feel this way. Honestly, I can't pinpoint a single thing. You tell me if I'm totally off base. Having nothing to do with, with anything having to do with him as a player or really ever having seen, I have no idea where I'm coming from on this, but I always felt like Marcus Mariota just seemed like one of the more upstanding professionals and good people to play quarterback. He's got the Hawaiian spirit that you want to gravitate I, towards? I, yeah, he just seems like a professional. Uh, I've never heard anything bad about him, right? Yeah, I have not. Just a nice, solid guy. But um, the other thing, I, literally, you know what we should do uh, on this program, for example? It, it feels like any more today, and I'm not mentioning any specific leagues and or sports, you should hire a group of people that do nothing but gather sponsorship or or gather donations or whatever if you're trying to get your your league, your sport, your company off the ground to pay for Netflix to do a documentary about you. I mean that that's the key, right? Marcus Mariota and Patrick Mahomes and Kirk Cousins not that they're not already household names. You watch. this. Will, people will absolutely, I'll bet you Marcus Mariota's jersey sales increase because of a Netflix documentary. And it's already um, been green-lighted for year two. Peyton didn't reveal who the quarterbacks would be, but obviously I, I would assume it's going to take on even more of a, hey, look at what it did for these guys last year. It's not this, you know, we aren't so super evasive living in your home. Those, I would think Josh Allen's got to be one, right? Yeah, and again, do you start to get some of the younger guys? You know, his relationship with Bryce Young has been right. pretty well documented. Um, you know, we'll, we'll see about any of the younger quarterbacks. I found Peyton interesting. He mentioned this. He was on with uh, McAfee earlier in the week that Steve Sable, you know, the godfather of NFL films, approached Peyton uh, lead into the 2011 season with this sort of pitch. Like, hey, this is the first time you've ever been hurt of any serious nature in your NFL career, let's follow your rehab. Let's document it. Let's turn it into something. And Peyton says, looking back on it, he regrets this decision, but he told him no. And that he was so indebted to, you know, his super controlled nature as a player at the time, he didn't want to do it. And Peyton now, you know, 12 years later, obviously has a different perspective on things. He was so guarded. I mean, it was like, isn't it funny imagining Peyton even oh, I discussing mean, that amongst himself? I remember asking, in like, 2011? so, you know, the, the neck thing, like, where are you standing? Well, you know, I mean, I, I don't know. I, the one thing I know about my neck is, is there's stuff called HIPAA, you know, and, and HIPAA it protects, you know, from it prevents me from talking about it. I remember, I remember him saying, HIPAA prevents me from talking about it. I'm like, no, actually, HIPAA prevents anybody else from talking about it. But it's your body, so you you HIPAA can. HIPAA seems so. to be a quick out for a lot of people in discussing no question. Injuries. Mark, have you seen the trailer? I have. I'm very intrigued by it. I do like that the three guys that they did select. It's kind of like the guy who's obviously considered the top quarterback in the league, a guy who's been a veteran but hasn't won at all, and then there's kind of like the journeyman in Mariota. Yeah. I like it a lot. Yeah, I'm uh, I'm really looking forward to that. So again, that premieres. Any idea how many episodes there are? Netflix. No, I I probably should have looked that up. I I, I don't. I, I would assume you know what six to eight, you know something like that. You know if you're gonna follow each of them around and you know want to give each of them a, a decent chunk of time through it all. So again, that debuts today on Netflix. A little bit stickier than it has been the last couple of mornings walking out to the car. I do think temperatures. Supposed to rise around 90, I believe some showers up in northern Indiana already here early on this Wednesday morning. Bless you, Jake. Uh, He is Jake Quarry. I am Kevin Bowen. Mark Dykton with us as always. Thank you for tuning in to Kevin and Quarry right here on a Wednesday, 93.5, 107.5, The Fan.
Morning Checkdown. Omaha! 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 On 93.5 and 107.5 The Fan. All right, last night in the Major League Baseball All-Star Game, the AL looked to be winning yet another one, but that changed in the top of the eighth, and it sounded like this. The 2-2. Swing and a high fly ball, left field. That one back, that one way back there. Elias Diaz, a home run, and the National League has taken a 3-2 lead as he blasts that one out to left. That was the Rockies catcher on the go-ahead shot there in the 8th, 32-year-old Elias Diaz. Uh, the NL held on from there. Craig Kimbrell did have some shaky moments in the ninth. walked uh, a couple of batters but struck out Jose Ramirez with two on to win it. I thought for a moment there, guys, we were going to get a derby swing-off. A That'd derby swing off like like a penalty kick. Yes, mm-hmm. that kind of that fun. those were the rules. If uh, it ended in a tie there, so we had some moments that it looked like it could happen. But the NL wins their first All Star game since 2012. By the way, Elias Diaz, former Indianapolis Indian, which is kind of cool, right? One of two Indianapolis Indians to play in the game last night. Uh, you swoosh like something else happened in the world of sports last night, Mark. Did I miss something? Oh, I'm sure there were summer league scores we could recap. Or NBA summer something. league, thank you, did uh, take place. And as a matter of fact, last night the San Antonio Spurs played, but Victor Wembanyama did not. And that leads you to wonder if the Pacers will follow suit by having some of their bigger name players now kind of step aside to get an opportunity for others to get some minutes. So Benedict Matherin, for example... Yeah, they're done. Matherin's done. Yeah. Nemhard's done. Isaiah Jackson's done. So, you know, this seems to be the trend across the summer league. You bring your, you know, high level vets in for a couple of games and then they exit. So tonight it's the Thunder at 7 30. If you're looking for other basketball action here locally before the WNBA heads to their all star break, uh, a matinee. I believe this will be a day for probably the kids inside of Gamebridge Fieldhouse. A noon tip for the Fever against New York. Uh, coming up here in a couple of hours. Their final game before the All-Star break. How about the uh, pair of changes from the uh, NBA Board of Governors for the rule changes? Yeah, so you get a second challenge if you get the first one right. Is Mm -hmm. that correct? And flopping, right? like that. Uh And then there's not a lot of black and white, though, with the flopping rule. It sounds like a lot of gray area. Yeah, yeah. So that'll be interesting how they make that a little more You could be penalized for flopping. Right. That's basically what they're saying. Yes, please. Yes. So that'd be I good mean, to see. I mean, how do you administer that, though? I guess you look at the video and see if there was even contact before a guy goes down. I, is that it? The guy's like, oh, I slipped. You know, I, I, I tripped. Yeah. I, it was a wet spot. I mean, I feel like we're going to have a whole lot of debate over that this One season. One-year trial basis for the flopping rule, so we'll see how it goes. And coming up here in a few hours across the pond, it will be Chris Eubanks, the final... American left, period. Uh, or I guess Madison Keys, I think, is still left on the women's side, so I should say the final male left. In Wimbledon, he is in the final eight against Daniil Medvedev. That will be a quarterfinal match starting here around 10 o'clock. Chris Eubanks, a hell of a story. This is a big-time Cinderella run for the 27-year-old Georgia Tech product, so we'll see if he can keep the dream alive heading into this weekend. By the way, the, the Wimbledon, as we talked about the other day, isn't it the the name of the complex itself? Do you know the full name of the complex? Uh, isn't it like the All England Club? All England Lawn Tennis and Croquet Club. Have you ever played croquet? My uncle used to have me over to his house back in the day, and we used to play it in the backyard. Like, are there people playing croquet outside the tennis courts at no. the All England Lawn Tennis and Croquet Club? I was like, Uncle Tad, you haven't mowed in two months. I mean, this this <laughs> the ball isn't, isn't rolling at all. We played it wrong. We just tried to swing the ball into each other's shins when we were kids. You talk about leaving a mark. Uh-huh. You just have to hit it through the little... The little hoop yeah, thing, nope, right? Much nope. easier said than done. to take my brother Ryan's shins out. You know what? Uh, let me tell you something. In this country, no lawn activity, and and it hurts me to say this to the two of you, because I'm guessing that both of you were denied this incredible opportunity. No lawn backyard family activity or sport or leisure has been the same in this country since some communist came in and ruled out jarts. Is that like lawn darts? Or is that wearing darts with jeans on? What is uh, I, I was going to say, is that what you call your jeans after you puke darts on them in the, the lawn pot? darts, yes, that, you, that uh-huh. you throw underhand into a ring. You know, they and they let that is that was did in cornhole his, overtake cornhole. Cornhole did kind of overtake it. Similar, similar, very similar. 
game, but there was nothing. Nothing has ever come close to it. Sounds like a candy Rosie would pick that, off that, the shelf. That at the honestly, gas like, yeah, I got jarts, Dad. There what have been a lot back? of things. There have been a lot of things that have happened in my lifetime in this in the history of this country from a social standpoint. Some and, but I think that we don't talk enough about the the absolutely an insane outlaw of jarts. Well, guess what? We've got the perfect spot on the sports calendar to have a big open discussion about it. <laughs> By the way, I, I I will say speaking of odd things in sports, it was pretty wild to watch like the future of professional golf in Congress yesterday. Did you catch any of that? Congressional he- isn't hearing isn't it always weird when sports the, gets into the yeah. I'm like, what these senators are discussing the PJ Tour versus Live and like some wild, wild comments out of that. We will have Will Haskett on in a few. It is British Open week, so we'll certainly have to chat about him. Uh, the head of the public investment fund in Saudi Arabia, Yasser, uh, he had a goal of trying to join Augusta National. That was one of the things he was hoping for in this agreement, which sounds like every golfer out there with that uh, desire. A uh, little Pacers conversation on the other side. Again, Miles Turner has been a big fan of something he's seen from one of the Pacers' newcomers here. In just the short stint that they've been together, we'll explain that. And some of that Paul George, a Tyrese Halliburton audio from Halliburton going on Paul's podcast. We'll play that coming up in a bit as well. Kevin Aquari here on a Wednesday, 93.5, 
Query on 93.5 and 107.5. The Fan. 13 minutes before the hour of 8 o'clock. My name is Jake Query. Kevin Bowen, the other voice you hear on this program. Mark Dykton as well. It's Kevin and Query here on 93.5, 107.5, The Fan. On what looks to be a pretty good looking day, but I think it's supposed to rain later in the day. Yeah, I think there is some rain up in northern Indiana right now. Uh, again, the Pacers back in Summer League action tonight. That is 7.30 with the Thunder. Um, as Summer League moves along, you know, typical Vegas fashion, no one needs to stay there longer than 48, 72 hours. So, Got a lot of the veterans that have either played in Summer League, Benedict Mather and Andrew Nemhard, Isaiah Jackson, uh, checking out after two games, or even some of the guys that have been there watching the Pacers. And, you know, Miles Turner is one of them. And, you know, this is part of what Summer League's kind of turned into of, obviously you have some core guys that are playing in the actual games, but it's a great opportunity for your new guys in Bruce Brown Jr. and Obi Toppin, for example, to take part in some early workouts. Your coaching staff is out there. You can get together. You can have, you know, whatever, a six, eight-person workout. And the Pacers had some of those out in Vegas. So the likes of Halliburton and Aaron Neesmith and Jordan Wara and Buddy Heald and Miles Turner. You know, those guys, along with their newcomers, of course, getting together for these workouts. And assuming Scott Agnes is back from Summer League tomorrow, we'll have him on to talk more about this. But Scott uh, caught up with Miles Turner out in Vegas And Miles, I thought, had an interesting quote about Obi Toppin based off these early workouts. And, you know, this comment, I I think, kind of falls in line with, you know, what I've been saying about, okay, Obi Toppin's time as a starter is much different than his time as a reserve. Miles said this about Obi. uh, I quote, I didn't realize he shoots it as well as he does. I've been working out the past couple of days, and he can really shoot the ball yeah that's what you were saying about his three-point percentage being when he is when he was a starter his three-point percentage was much higher than when he was coming off the bench so when he when you have other players that kind of distract defenses away from him he's got the ability to knock down shots right yeah as a reserve which was primarily his duty problem in new york he was a 30 percent three-point shooter which is certainly a liability uh, when you're playing kind of a modern day stretch floor stretch four as a starter, 15 games, so it's not a huge sample size, but it's also not some small, small sample size, uh, 44% from three, and that was on six attempts per game. And again, Miles, I think that's a pretty candid comment from Turner and being like, yeah, I just assumed he was a dunker. You know, that's that's kind of the thought process that I had, but no, he, can, he has shot it really well with us in these workouts, and if you're going to give him an extended – a look from a minute standpoint, or even as a starter, we'll see about him and Jairus Walker and that debate for the starting four spot. Um, this is a guy that you know could tap into a little bit more shooting ability, and if he can do that, now all of a sudden you're talking about a player that's going to reach uh, a, a much higher level than what New York saw over the last couple of years. What did you think of Miles Turner's outfit? A lot of people were not on board with his outfit that he was wearing. Yeah, walk me through that again. It was like some pink uh, button down or something like that. Yeah, and then like some kind of capri pants and what looked to be nice uh, slipper loafers kind of deal with the 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 shoes looked like the kind that you would get if you were like at a country club and you forgot your dress shoes and they have like a some sort of a seal or a crest on them. Yeah, just block shots, stay out of foul trouble, stay healthy, and hit open threes, and you can you can be <laughs> naked for all I care. I, Miles Turner is the, strictly by opinion here, the most misunderstood in terms of what his team asks of him by the fan base of any player that's played in this town in 20 years. People think that Miles Turner is supposed to be like when he was drafted, I think people thought like, okay, because it was the era where everybody was trying to get their Kevin Durant. And Turner can shoot the ball. There's no doubt about that. But I think people thought that Turner was like, why is he not out in the wing? Why is he not shooting more? He does, you know, Miles Turner does his job very well for what it is that Indiana asks him to do. What the franchise and the coaching staff asks Miles Turner to do is 100% different than what fans would like to see him do. And what Miles Turner does, there's a reason he is still here. And that is because. They wanted to be able to get players that could benefit off of what Miles Turner does. 
Miles Turner was a critically important rim protector during a time for Indiana where they didn't have anybody guarding on the wings. And that made his job that much more important because he was the last line of defense at the basket when the other two lines of defense were nowhere to be found. He's been a critically important member of this franchise. He has, for the most part, done everything they asked him to do. And I think it's, it is it is invigorating to see now that they are putting players around him that feed off of the way that he plays and that the guy enjoys and that they enjoy him. I think he's a, I mean, he's obviously a big part of what they have planned. And, but I get a, a guy that, that, facilitates offensive transition by protecting the rim that occasionally steps out. And I do think probably at times he hangs on the perimeter more than they'd like. But I know for a fact that Kevin Pritchard has said to him, like, feel free to shoot the ball. Like, you can shoot the ball. And we'd like to see you shoot the ball if the offensive sets come to you in that situation. And by, by that, I mean away from extended out beyond the lane. So – he has done the things that they've asked him to do. You know, I'll be curious behind Turner what the Pacers do because I still think that's a pretty big log jam just on paper right now. Yeah, I'd you know, agree with that and with guys that all kind of do the same thing, right? Isaiah Jackson, Daniel Tice, Jalen Smith at Although this point. Tice doesn't, but. I think has to be viewed as a five, you know, with Jairus Walker and Obi Toppin being more of your kind of modern look to your four. And Jalen Smith, I think, had that opportunity last year. Isaiah Jackson, yeah, he had some moments in Summer League, but again, the dude still fouls way too much. And. If Turner is going to be a guy that misses any time, you, you certainly want some reliability behind him. And I think last season when he was not on the floor, and obviously it coincided with Halliburton a lot, but that was a big loss for you. It's a team that already is awful on defense. When you lose that kind of bailout rim protector at times, it's a big deal. So, uh, again, Pacers in action tonight, and you will get a... What, a longer look at guys like Ben Shepard, Kendall Brown, Oscar Shibway. I'm looking forward to Nate Lashevsky, my Notre Dame guy. He's on the Summer League Oscar roster. Shibway, I'm ex- interested in seeing. Mojave King. You like Mojave King, don't you? I like the name. I don't know if we'll ever see him, though. Outside, This might be it. So get your last look at Mojave King in here. saying that they might desert him? Well, him and fanboy Zhang going to hang out. <laughs> This this time last year was when Fanboy started to step out you know, and hit a know, few threes. Fanboy's a funny guy, but Mojave King has more of a dry sense of humor. God, can we go to break? <laughs> deep down, deep down, you got to be saying to yourself, it ain't even 8 a.m. yet. This guy, that's what you're saying to yourself, right, Kevin? The, the, impressive. Not even 8 a.m. And, and just wham, wham, two, two for two right there, right? The future professional golf that's In my opinion, that sucks. In Congress yesterday, the British Open starts tomorrow, so great morning television coming up. Each of the next four mornings to chat more about that, Will Haskett from PGA Tour Radio on the other side, mercifully here on Kevin Aquari, 93.5, 107.5 The Fan.
to Kevin and Query on 93.5 and 107.5. The Fan. British Open next week. Kevin Br- Bowen British Open. jumping the gun on that one. We got the Scottish Open, though, this week in the world of golf. And oh, that we is play train spotting. A little appointment television here from a morning standpoint to go along with your Wimbledon. But yesterday in the world of golf, uh, they were in front of Congress, and that's where we're at right now with the latest in the PGA Tour Live Golf Front. And to talk more about that, Will Haskett from PGA Tour Radio joins us. Will, I'm not going to lie, at one point last night as the All-Star Game bored me, I flipped over to the Golf Channel, and I'm thinking, oh, there's going to be like an old British Open rerun on, I, you know, I, something that I'm going to really enjoy watching. And instead, I'm literally watching, I feel like I'm watching C-SPAN, and in about a 10-minute period, I think I laughed 80% of the time. At one point, I wanted to cry, and I thought it was also eye-opening. Uh, what did you make of the congressional hearings yesterday? Really one-sided. It was just the PJ Tour having to answer to Congress in this potential deal. I don't think I got any smarter watching that yesterday. I don't think I believed any stronger in our elected officials <laughs> because of yesterday's proceedings, especially a few of them that were just grossly either misinformed or on a mission or scorned or what. I mean, it was, were there a couple of juicy little takeaways? You know, were there a few things from discovery and emails that were released, both that were talked about and then were also kind of, um, I guess, leaked or discovered within various media channels yesterday that at least gave us, I don't know, a, a minute look at what was discussed and what were some of the hopeful elements of a negotiation. Yes. But at the end of the day, it was, it was a bunch of, well, I guess, you know, it's Richard Blumenthal's kind of crusade, right? Like he's the, he was the the Senator from Connecticut who seems to be the most irate about this situation. And I think was saying a lot of the same things that people are frustrated about, but I think, at the end of the day, it arrived back at the same place, which is this is the reality. I don't know how you change what the reality of the situation is. And then secondly, there isn't anything agreed upon, like formally yet. The only thing agreed upon is to stop litigating against each other. That's it. Like, And so while there, you can say, oh, are you going to do this? Or can you promise us that you won't do this? It's like, well, they haven't signed a dotted line. Now, there are reports that they're about 90% of the way there. I don't know how yesterday helps get an agreement across the finish line because it just, I feel, just muddies the waters a little bit. Like it, it was just, I think it was unnecessary. And there were a couple of senators that were like, hey, look, I'm happy to come back and talk about this when you actually have an agreement in place. But, man, can we go to lunch? Because this doesn't seem like a good use of our time right now. And I think I probably agree with those guys the most. Yeah, not uh, not a good day for the state of Missouri when Senator Josh oh, Hawley yeah. is what an idiot. Is, I mean, I'm truly an idiot. Like, I'm sorry if you're from Missouri and you're listening to the show right now. Like, just, and you want to get him out of office, just play the tape back from yesterday. Holy cow, what yeah. a moron that guy looked like. Cardinals fans having some issues with, with that. For those that missed it, Josh Hawley produces what I thought was a very nice looking poster board on the PJ Tour and their involvement with China. Unfamiliar that the PJ Tour has not played in China in four years. And he needed to have that question answered to him about nine times before. I don't know if he ever really gave up on that, but before he finally gave up on it. Okay, when you bring up Juicy, for the casual sports fan out there, there were some Juicy tidbits. What did you find that you would say maybe would move the needle a little bit? Uh, Probably more so from a discovery standpoint, as you mentioned. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, there were a whole bunch of, I guess, side agreements that we don't know. I mean, that haven't been executed or we don't know if they're going to be a part of the next sort of framework. I think that I guess the biggest one that gathered the most headlines was that the PGA Tour just sort of said, if we agree to come, if we end up with a full agreement with this one, that you, the PIF, who is in control of Live Golf, is going to ax Greg Norman. I mean, I think that was the juiciest one yesterday. And it really was more just because it was something that I guess was kind of in writing, although I don't really see, from what we knew about the potential makeup of the structure of this, I don't think anybody really thought that there was a pathway forward for Greg Norman to still be in charge of Liv, despite what he's sort of saying behind the scenes to his staff and to the people on that particular circuit. But I think that was the one that probably created the most waves because it kind of came early on in the proceedings before things just kind of got muddied by all the questions. So I guess to me that was 
the juiciest nugget, even though logically you just figured that was always going to be the case if these two sides agreed to play ball with one another. Yeah, well, I think my question is, and my apologies for being an overly simple or simplistic to it all, but with this merger of live and the PGA and you know absorption, how, whatever term you want to use, yeah. is the bigger question how it gets blended philosophically or how it gets blended from a personnel standpoint? Does that make sense what I'm asking? Yeah. I think personnel is probably what Congress is most concerned about. Um, Richard Blumenthal, you know, kept throwing out, you know, the big words about, you know, sports are essential to our culture. And this is an iconic, you know, pillar of our society, that being the PGA Tour and professional golf. And then his sort of his view that part of this agreement, whereas the PGA Tour is sitting there saying, listen, we are still going to control our product. Like we are in, our board is in control of the PGA Tour. We are not merging, and that's true in some sense. The PGA Tour is not merging with Liv. They're forming an umbrella for-profit organization that will that will oversee a lot of these other in the organizations, DP World Tour, the PGA Tour, Liv Golf, and whatever um, reality it has moving forward. And But those individual entities still operate under whatever their controlling structure is right now. Now, part of that agreement, again, in principle, not yet signed on, is that, you know, the governor of the PIF, Alderman, would have a seat on the board. Some believe that he might be chairman of the PGA Tour, depending on which version of the draft you believe. And then it's a semantic argument at that point in time to people who are against this because it's like, well, even if they're on the board and only have a minority stake in this company, we all know like whoever has the most money is the one that's going to be making the decisions. And so I think there is a, at the end of the day, probably a personnel concern that members of Congress have, but the PGA tour just sat there all day yesterday and just doubled down over and over again. Like, listen, Jay Monahan would be the head of the new for-profit entity. So the chairman or, or sorry, the commissioner of the PGA tour would oversee this new blended for-profit organization. And the PGA tour is not losing its majority board member vote players, et cetera, on it. We're just, this is what, this is the cost of doing business in order to get the, what they also alluded to yesterday was a, investment of over a billion dollars from the PIF into this for-profit entity that's going to then trickle that money down to the PGA Tour, the DP World Tour, and other golf-related um, investments in the sport. So, yeah, a long-winded way to say I think they're I, – I think it's this sort of – I think the people who are really, really up in arms about it are like, okay, sure, you can say all these things, you still have 51% ownership, but we know if the 49% person in the room is also the one that's bringing in all the money, then who's really in power here? And I think that was the, the biggest contentious point of yesterday. And the other one being, like, why do you need their money? Can't you just go out and get somebody else's billion dollars, which I find to be kind of laughable. Will Haskett with us here from PJ Tour Radio. Well, do you think it's fair to say at this point, given the nature of how public some of these conversations have become, and yesterday certainly was an eye-opener on that, of you know dangling Tiger Woods out there for the Saudis, dangling Rory McIlroy out there for the Saudis, is it fair to say like the PJ Tour needs this more so than the Saudis need it? Um, I mean, I think if, I think if the whole thing blew up right now, so like they don't get to an agreement, they don't get it across the finish line. Everybody goes back to their corners and they figure things out. And the PIF has to figure out how to make live viable and not lose hundreds of millions of dollars on it every year. And the PGA Tour has to figure out how to maintain designated events or maintain purses with an unsustainable financial model moving forward that they could probably continue on down the road for a while. You get some pissed um, off membership, though. Yeah, you would have some. I mean, I think you have pissed off membership no matter what because of the lack of transparency leading to this moment in time. And, you know, people who are like, look, you told us to take to draw this line in the sand and now you're not. I, I think there's a lot of everything kind of settles in time, right? So a wound has been open in the beginning of June for many of the membership. And then eventually time heals all that wound. We've played a several tournaments since then. There's been, you know, everything from a day-to-day operation standpoint is status quo. You know, checks are still clearing. The purses are still high. There's been good golf. The entertainment product is thus. 
And so if we get to an agreement and those week to weeks sort of feel and look the same, maybe there would be a tweak here and there. Maybe there's a tournament in Saudi Arabia, you know, at the end of the year for particular people, you know, like subtle little things, but you don't lose a lot of the stuff that looks normal. Then I think it doesn't matter. But, but yeah, I, I think going back to this, it's like, why are both sides wanting to create this? I think long-term the PGA tour, and I thought Ron Price did a good job laying that yesterday, the CEO of the PGA tour sort of saying is that, we, this is the only time right now we can still operate from a position of power because they have influence and they have the product that sports fans still recognize as being superior, but they're being blood dry. So we can negotiate now or wait until we're literally running out of money because we can't compete with this. Well, at the same point in time, PIF is recognizing that, yes, we could bleed them dry, but we're also not a big fan of losing half a billion dollars a year on our own golf product that no one watches and no one cares about for the most part. And... So I guess to answer your question, yes, the PGA Tour needs it more because they're the only ones truly in danger of run of not being able to turn the lights on in however many years that takes. But I also don't think that the, you know, the Saudis are in business to lose tons and tons of money either. And it, it makes a lot of sense for them to try and kind of bury the hatchet and figure out how to move forward. So, again, this is way too long of an answer for a pretty simple question. I guess, yes, the PGA Tour needs it more but it would have been a long time until they truly actually needed it. So, Will, let me ask you this, and feel free to tell me that to go fly a kite because it's the dumbest thing you've ever heard. Can we rule out at this point that the PGA is not simply almost the victim of the Saudi investment group's test balloon into their slow and maybe even like warning shot to other leagues of their acclimation and conversion into multiple sports properties in the United States. I think that golf is more susceptible to the influence of this money because it is so driven by individuals. So the fact that any one of your players can just up and say, like, look, I'm going to quit and go take the bag of money, which It'd be significantly harder for, say, the, the the public investment fund of Saudi Arabia to start a competitive professional basketball league opposite the NBA and be able to pay enough star players enough money to go make a great product. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, be, I, I'm telling you, aren't they I, doing I, that a little bit with well, soccer though? Sure, but like, but they're bu- but they're buying into teams, and yes, the Saudi. And, and, and they're also buying some players to come over and play, which I think could be a, a long-term sort of slow. But we've seen a lot of players in their prime right now sort of rebuke the, those advances, right? Like Ronaldo's at the end of his career. Like a lot of these guys are at the very end of their career. They're not going to get the money that they're getting somewhere. But we've seen a number of players in their late 20s and early 30s say, no, I still want to play in the league that has the most attention, that has the best competition, and I can still sort of get paid. And then on, from a other professional sports standpoint, you know, there's so many contracts right now involved with NBA players, NFL players. I mean, again, this is highly spec. Uh, I, listen, I, I know I'm crazy, Will, but I'm telling you, the it is the 800-pound impermeable, impermeable, sure. excuse me, gorilla. But the NFL has not one but two existing alternate leagues. The NBA does not. Major League Baseball does not. With the NFL. I don't think for any stretch of the imagination the Saudis would have any interest in all of a sudden becoming an ownership group of, say, the USFL. But if they all of a sudden come to, to – maybe it's not Patrick Mahomes, but maybe it's Travis Kelsey, and they say, we'll pay $35 million to play for the Birmingham Stallions next year, and then we're going to pay Justin Jefferson you know, $42 yeah. million to play. And you get those players over there. Now you've sent the wake. You've sent right the the warning shot to the NFL to where the NFL then goes. You know what? We better let these guys money come in here because it's never ending, and we're going to be right back to 1984 all over again. Even though they won yeah, that lawsuit, I, I think it's a bigger. I think it's a it's a much riskier financial proposition from their end, being the Saudis end, to try and play that game to see if they could actually win it and dominate it. Whereas it's. I think it's a good business decision for them to invest in the way they've invested in Premier League soccer teams, in Formula One racing, and even in golf. And again, golf, I think, lends itself to an easier um, swaying of particular talent when it comes to that money. So, yeah, I mean, I think I think the PGA Tour was more susceptible to it than some other sports leagues in this 
country that are more franchise driven, the franchises have as much, if not more value than many of the players. Now we can argue that that's changed a lot in the last 15, 20 years of sport where players have become their own brands and have become bigger and stronger and everything. But your loyalty as a golf fan is to the, the sport and to particular players that can easily be swayed to move. My loyalty to the Indianapolis Colts or the Indiana Pacers is probably a little bit stronger than if Tyrese Halliburton signs a deal to go play for, you know, some team in you know the Middle East or something like that, if that makes, you know, if that makes sense. So I think it's a harder place to get into. And, and we've seen, I mean, Adam Silver had to come out and comment on it a couple of days ago because they've put, you know, language into the collective bargaining agreement about sovereign wealth funds and what sort of ownership they can have because, you know, the Washington Wizards are now 5% owned by Qatar's sovereign wealth fund as part of their conglomerate that owns them, the Mystics, the Capitals, and, and whatever else, other franchises that are owned by that group. Um, so, I mean, I think some of these leagues are putting in safeguards for the, for the short term to try and avoid, you know, a, a takeover, I guess, of one particular team. But golf in this instance, I think was more susceptible to it. And also keep in mind that it's a, it's an elitist sport. And a lot of the moves that Saudi Arabia is making in this world, whether you call it sports washing or not, is to try and legitimize themselves as a Western, you know, or I guess ingratiate themselves with that word, um, you know, liken themselves to Western society. And it's a really easy way. And and Governor Al Ramayan is like a massive golf nut. Like there was some funny stuff that came out yesterday about how he's trying to negotiate through all these deals, a chance to become a member at Augusta National, which is, you know, just kind of funny. Like, hey, if we do this, can I get an Augusta membership? I don't blame him. Out of this deal? Yeah, I mean, try it. Like get in the fine print there and see if, you know, see if they'll let him in. I think that there's that there's also a lot of personal desire in this because the guy's an absolute golf junkie too. And they recognize this kind of the place to go hang out with the biggest and wealthiest and most influential people in Western society. All right. Well, last one for me. And as always, I appreciate your insight on what is a very confusing topic. Um, when we spoke probably a month, month and a half ago, when all of this first started, I think I said to you, then we are like so early in all of this. I, I, I maybe even threw yeah. out like we're on lap one or two of a of a Indy 500 200 mile race or 200 lap race, and you're like, I don't even know if we're on lap one or two. It seems like a month and a half later, we're still like on lap one or two of of all of this. When do we hit timelines? I, I thought I said saw something yesterday where maybe like the end of the year you have to have an agreement in place, or I, I don't know what the result would be from that. But like, when do we start actually putting like real feet to the fire? And boom, we have real decisions. It's not a framework agreement. We've got to sign stuff, and we get actually some clarity on what the future of professional golf could look like. I don't know if it was mentioned yesterday in it or if it was reported by another outlet, but it sound, I, th- I thought I read somewhere that they said that they think they're about 90% of the way done in terms of the lawyers going back and forth with the agreement. Now, again, I don't know if yesterday helps or hurts that, you know, if did everybody answer the questions in an, an appropriate enough way, you know, there was a lot of, posturing about, you know, you guys had to sign an agreement that you wouldn't disparage Saudi Arabia, which is actually pretty standard. I mean, if if I was trying to uh, acquire your show right now and we had agreed to a framework agreement, a standard clause in that would be that neither one of us are going to publicly talk bad about one another because, well, that would hurt the potential acquisition that we're having right now. So you know, that came up a lot. So I don't know if yesterday ends up hurting those negotiations and what the lawyers behind the scenes are doing to sort of hammer out which seems to be an iteration almost every day in back and forth correspondence. Some of that was, that was leaked. If we're going to take the Indy 500 analogy, I think we're probably a couple of laps away from our first round of pit stops. And by that, I mean, we should probably have a PGA tour schedule for next year. Pretty soon live is hammering out, whether it's maybe their last full season or not, at least just sort of a way for us to see like what golf is going to look like in 2024 Um, which will then give us an opportunity to sort of see, oh, okay, well, within the framework that they're probably agreeing upon, maybe they're they're planting the seeds for what I think is going to be the shift in all of this to operations in 2025. Um, But I would guess we'll get, you know, I guess little Easter eggs of what is to come when we actually see a schedule for 2024 and how that ends up being structured. But again, long, you know, long part of the race here, the checkered flag probably doesn't fly until 2025 or at least until sometime next year when we get a 2025 schedule and we know what a combined entity looks like in terms of professional golf. Um, so yeah, so that would be kind of my timeline. Like we should have a schedule for both tours 
somewhat shortly. We can react to that. Then we'll probably have an agreement closer to the end of the year. We'll certainly react to that, but we won't see an application of it until 2025. By the way, was so was Josh Hawley, my apologies for my naivete here, was Josh Hawley, the senator, upset about the PGA's involvement with the Saudis? No, China. He didn't. I don't think he even. I don't even mention. It was all China. Saudi Arabia. The poster was board China. was all but, China. Well, he he but apparently. How dare you? How dare you? You know, interact with China, which your series hasn't existed in four years. Right. Okay. So he didn't. I thought he was questioning also their accepting money from Saudi Arabia. Well, I think he it was also, the accepting he also from dropped China. Like a Gary Woodlands from Kansas, ha ha ha, I'm from Missouri, sort of thing. It's just like, what is happening right now? Like, I don't, I don't know what was happening. What's gotcha. that rivalry called? Kansas, Missouri is it the border. Uh, the border war would be border war? that's Missouri, Illinois. Yeah, they. I, what is the civil war? Who is the civil war? Uh, the civil Oregon, war is Oregon State, Oregon, right? Oregon State, right? Oregon, Oregon State, yeah. 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 By the way, Jake Will, an extremely accomplished golfer, word on the street is he had a pretty intense match with a buddy of mine, Sean, um, last week or so, and it sounded like there's some high high drama with that. We were partners last Friday and won some money, but yeah. Partners was, turned enemies, chirpy. right? In a, in a, sh- a, in a short chirpy. period of time? Yeah, he was a little chirpy last week, but he was playing chirpy. well. He wanted to get a little more in my pocket. Okay. <laughs> Forgive well. and forget. Hey, you know, public investment fund is alive and well in all of us right now. Uh, Will, you've been terrific with us. Uh, enjoyed the 12-3 to 3 appearance yesterday. Thank you as always. Enjoy talking about no sports today. Yeah, uh, that is what the world of golf is. Again, the British Open next week, the final major of the year. Jake, does it is there an ounce of fascination with you in this? I mean, I know golf is nowhere near what it is for you as it is for me, but is there like any sort of intrigue? I feel like you've hinted at it with Will before, and I think it's a great question you continue to ask of like, what does this mean for other I, That's my thing. I just I can't imagine this is where it ends, right? And I think a, a, a big part of that probably is how it turns out, right? If 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 through the process of the Saudi money, the PIF, the the Live Golf, if through this merger with the PGA, what it shows is that Live was nothing more than like a shell game for the Saudis to then infiltrate their money and their power and influence into the PGA, then that, to me, says Katie bar the door on all other professional sports. But it depends on how they, whether or not they end up winning this arm wrestling match or not. Yeah, so, yeah, I, that part is fascinating to me. I, I think it's a totally relevant question to ask. I think for now it is simply this is our avenue. First off, Yasser, the head of the Public Investment Fund, is obsessed with golf, as Will pointed out. So I think there is personal interest. And then I think there's major financial interest of this gets us at the table with a lot of you know Western business, if you will. And it gets that you know one-on-one interaction with, you know, whatever, elite companies uh, in this part of the world. And that is also something that they want to diversify from a – economic standpoint and get away from you know so much oil driven economy for them uh our second will is going to join us coming up here at nine o'clock that would be will carroll we'll recap the all-star game from last night and preview a little bit more of the second half of the mlb season and let's lead off the morning check down with what happened last night in seattle the morning check down on 93.5 and 107.5, The Fan. Boy, it looked like the AL was going to get another one done, but in the top of the eighth, it was 32-year-old Rockies catcher Elias Diaz doing this to eventually win the game for the NL. The 2-2. Swing and a high fly ball. Left field. That one back. That one way back there. God! Elias Diaz, a home run! And the National League has taken a 3-2 lead as he blasts that one out to left. Boog Shambi on the call right there. Craig Kimbrell wasn't smooth in the ninth. Walked a couple batters, but struck out Jose Ramirez for the victory. And Jake, the NL wins their first All-Star game since 2012. But that does not mean the Reds will have home field in the World Series. And they do it courtesy of a home run there, as you heard from a former Indianapolis Indian. Pretty cool. By the way, I thought the mic'd up pitching was super cool. 
I, they've done a great job with the mic'd I mean, up stuff in recent years. When a guy's just sitting there talking to him, like right before he makes a pitch, just in mid conversation, like, yeah, you know, so it was pretty cool to hang out with the guys yesterday. Phew, fastball. That is one of the best things that baseball's yes. done. Jerseys need to change back to their actual uniforms, but the mic'd up, keep it coming. How you about know, we do the throwback jerseys for the Midsummer Classic? Everybody wears throwbacks. What they should do is if they picked a, per- I, I could get behind that. If they picked a particular year, like let's say forty years or whatever it may be. So everybody wears their team's jersey from 1983 or 19, you know, whatever year you want to pick, 73. What, as long as it's uniform every year for for all teams. In addition to that, somebody said, I, I, someone tweeted to us and said this was all about marketing and jersey sales. I, I am I am 1,000 percent convinced that you would be far more likely if you're a fan of the Philadelphia Phillies. You would be far more likely to buy the jersey of a Philadelphia Philly player that's a Phillies jersey that has the All Star patch on the shoulder mm-hmm. than just a baby blue jersey that says National and then has your player's name on the back. And look, you, you might be marketing from a jersey sales standpoint, but you're not marketing for name recognition because it's impossible to tell who these guys are unless uh, what's his name that uh, that was on the call last night. Joe Joe Davis is telling you who it, who it is. And and Kevin, if you for, were a for, kid, you know, 80% of them. I know we we can recognize Otani and, you know, th- those guys, etc. If you're a young player getting introduced to the game of baseball and you see a guy playing and he makes some neat plays or or he does something funny or he's mic'd up and says something funny and you're like, "I really like that that guy." The next time you see him play, he's wearing a totally different uniform. It just it's not going to resonate to you whereas if he is wearing a a Padres uniform out there, then you're like, that's my team. I like the Padres because I like that player instead of I like the National or the American. I mean, Mark probably has the best idea in terms of marrying the two. Name recognition, and in August, I can recognize who that is, and jersey sales from the standpoint of go retro. Right. Yeah. You know, okay, that's what I mean. Um, Have the young kids diff- actually see some old jerseys well, from the 70s Elias and 80s. Diaz last night is wearing the 19-whatever, 82 Colorado Rocky jersey. Well, and that now, wouldn't exist, but yeah. Just but yes. throw an example out there. And now all of a sudden you go to the Rockies gift shop and that's available. Right. You know, and an all-star well, patch is on there. But yet it still says, whatever, Colorado or Rockies. I get the fact that there's a camaraderie of you are either with the National League or the American League. But I think that is more exemplified for young people by seeing players that are all wearing their independent team uniforms and then saying, that guy's wearing a Phillies uniform and that guy's wearing a Padres uniform and that guy's wearing a Pirates uniform, but they're all on the same team tonight. It reinforces the cool aspect of the All-Star game. Either do that or do the City Connect jerseys that everybody has. Everybody wears their City Connect jerseys. Yeah, those black jerseys the Reds are wearing on Friday nights. That'd be cool. Yeah, Yeah. I'm good with that. Uh, Speaking of City uniforms, we've certainly seen that in basketball today. Uh, if you're looking for something on your lunch break, uh, head over to Gamebridge Fieldhouse. The Fever have got their final game before the All-Star break. Again, it's been a recent struggle, to say the least. Seven straight losses, uh, but they are playing at noon today against New York. And then tonight, NBA TV, again, for the Pacers. Uh, that will be the Thunder. Uh, no Benedict Matherin, no Andrew Nemhard, no Isaiah Jackson. They are done in Summer League. Uh, so expect a lot of run for the Jairus Walker, Ben Shepard, Isaiah Wongs of the world uh, as we now kind of move into the really the rookie undrafted free agent portion of the Summer League. Either one of you guys know what Snapdragon is? Hmm. If we had to guess, what would Snapdragon be? Isn't that like an app from back in the day or something Cousin like that? Cousin of Puff? The, that's, a good, that's a good guess. The Dragon? Cousin of Puff, yeah. The, the, the dancing dragon. version of it. I, Snapdragon sounds like it would either be some sort of a – like high speed fiber internet company or oh yeah like a great IT company yeah or like um it's a type of flower too isn't it that that sounds like it could be maybe a i don't know like some sort of a dessert snack but i'm i'm going with because of the fact that Snapdragon Stadium is in San Diego California i'm guessing it has something to do with technology but that is the site of the pitch to use that term tonight United States Panama and that gold cup of the league uh, or the tournament that I can't pronounce. Boy, you sound really into it. How many people are into it? Well, um, I would say actually probably a decent amount from a soccer standpoint. Can you name the other two teams playing tonight? Uh, well, it's U.S. and Panama, right? And one, Correct. and the U.S. beat Canada and the other. I, I'm guessing here. Let's go with Mexico and Costa Rica. Uh, Mexico's one. Mexico and Jamaica. 
Jamaica. I, I, I believe it's pronounced CONCACAF. Is that right? I, I, I know what it is. Right. and But I just, I've heard a lot of people say, actually, soccer fans have told me, they're like, yeah, people aren't as into it because it's like basically their, their C League team. But still, tonight, uh, that game, I believe, gets underway at 7 30 Eastern time. Did you look up Snapdragon, Mark? Uh, like I said, the flower popped up, and I can see what else pops up. But. Uh, as Mark does that, coming up here in a couple <laughs> of hours, we'll get Chris Eubanks on the court in Wimbledon. Again, the quarterfinalist from America, American males making runs in Wimbledon. Haven't really happened a whole lot here as of late. It's a pretty Cinderella-type run for him. He will get the number 3 overall seed, Daniil Medvedev, here coming up. Approximately, I think, around uh, 9.30, 10 o'clock, but I believe there's a match before um, that will obviously impact when that one can. Some mobile platform smartphone company. Yeah, I was going to say it had to be, had to be some sort of a. So is that where the um, Colts played that NFL game to start the year? Didn't the Chargers? I think play that's in right. That? The Chargers played it for a year, right? Yeah. Philip Rivers right. against the Colts, right? Uh, let me make sure it's the right one. No, I actually, feel like it was called something different. No, this is a different called. stadium. Actually, this is the former San Diego State football stadium, right? Oh, okay. So we got two that holds thirty-five thousand. I, I believe that's no. Ones. I guess you're right. Snapdragon Stadium under construction in November of 2021. It was originally named Aztec Stadium. That probably was while they were trying to get, like, you know, sponsorship for it. Um, but it does not show that the Chargers played there. I, I, who the hell? I don't know. Boy, Luke just alerted me of a Pacers bet that is an absolute lock. Do I need to oh, empty the five twenty nine again? What, what what is it here? Well, you, why don't you tell us on the other side? Let's let's do that. We will do that on the other side. Kevin Aquare here on a Wednesday, 93.5, 107.5.
Kevin and Query on 93.5 and 107.5. The Fan. Boy, I, uh, I can't believe this, Jake. Luke just sent this to me. He goes, it's that time of year again to make some money for your daughter's college fund. Uh, preach. Uh, hammer the over, he says. I'm shocked that it is this low, honestly, and I would agree wholeheartedly with that. Um, the Pacers over-under on wins for this season. Okay. I'm going to guess that the over-under for Pacers on wins this year should be at, what was it a year ago? 30, right? So, no, no, no. Last year, my bet was 30. The over-under, I think, was like 23, right? Or two, it was like 23 and a half or 24 and a half. I chose to do the alternate odds. I bumped that up to at least 30 wins. Uh, they I'm gonna won say, 35. I'm going to say that this there. year their over-under is at 30, somewhere between 38 and 42. Mark, care to guess? 34 and a half. Mark Dykton's a gambler. Uh, over under is 35 and a half. Whew. Yeah, I would take that. We got to hammer that over again, don't we? You would, you would think. Yeah. Now, Tyrese Halliburton last year played 56 games. See, that's so, there. Now you're getting into the. You know, he missed 26 games. How much of that was he really, really out? Would he have played in more? I, I mean, the Pacers the Pacers pretty much tanked the last month of the year. Well, I mean, let's just call a spade a spade. Uh, the Pacers might have not publicly wanted to state that, but they did. So assuming that they don't do that, they won 35 last year. I think 42 is very real. Should I do the alternate and go 40? I don't know. I don't know if I'm that risky just yet. I've got a few months to, to uh, simmer on. So, wait, so if you put... Twenty dollars down for them to win forty to go over forty. Well, now win. we're getting into alternate lines. So uh, this is I mean. this is just even money on the um, over under thirty five and a half. Let me see if I can find that for you. You what, said you want to bump it up to forty. What, what if you went forty five? You got super aggressive and you said over under of forty five. Are we there yet with win total? I'm a little surprised that we're already at win totals because I mean, like, don't we still have a Damian Lillard thing to figure out? Yeah, but he's not going to affect the Pacers, right? Unless he goes to and well, he's going I mean, to Miami, probably. You know, is there a trickle down effect of that? Of you know how the Eastern Conference is viewed or the Pacers roster? I, I cannot find that right now. I, I have a feeling that will be upcoming. By the way, the Fever nine and a half point underdog today to the Liberty. <laughs> now let me tell you something. If you're taking that action, hell, you got it. One eight hundred nine with it. Is the number just so Is today know. one of those days where all the kids get in the building there? A noon tip? Do they do that in the summer? They should. That'd be awesome. The summer camps are going on, I'm sure. That's one of the activities. Yeah, imagine the Liberty trying to shoot free throws with a bunch of screaming kids. Did you guys go to summer camp? Mark, did you go to a summer camp when you were a kid? I did, yeah. What camp? Oh, geez, I don't know. It must have been a good camp. <laughs> I, might, I just remember my mom would drop us off at like some yeah building with a park and like, hey, go, <laughs> go find the person. Day, day camp or overnight camp? Day camp. Okay. Kevin? Yeah, I was more of a day camper. Um, yeah, I think I've talked about it before. I absolutely love my time at Butler basketball camp. That was literally my favorite thing every summer. I was like that with Taylor basketball camp when I was really little. I could have sworn Brad Stevens ran the Butler camp one year I was there. Would, would that have matched? Would he have been like in the director of basketball oh, sure. operations yeah, yeah. when I was 11? 94. What, what year did he leave Lily? Oh, you were born in 89, so 2000? Yeah, I was going to say turn of the century. Yeah, I think so. Because I remember covering Butler. They list 01 as his first year as a Butler assistant. Yeah, I think it's entirely possible. Um, but yeah, summer of 2000, yeah. I have a buddy right now whose children go to a camp in New York State. Whoa. Upstate New York, and it's a seven-week overnight camp. What? Are you Whoa. It's the whole, Tell us not, more. It's fifteen grand per kid. Okay. What are they? Tell us more. So my buddy Steinberg is a doctor. He lives in Florida. Is that his first name? Last, okay. Doctor Steinberg. Um, yeah. I here's what's weird. So Dave Steinberg, my buddy, we grew up together. For whatever reason, I don't even know how it came to be. When Beavis and Butthead was a thing, we each talked to each other on the phone in Butthead's voice. 
Oh my God! Thank nope. the Lord, I wasn't on the phone for that. <laughs> no, no Beavis, just Butthead. Well, that, he's that could be said for seven to ten. He's actually in my phone as Butthead. Okay. And now he's a doctor, you said? He He's a doctor. He lives in Miami. And when we talk on the phone, we literally do the butthead voice back and forth to each other the entire time. Do I you mean, even know who your kids are when they return like, after seven weeks? Like, well, so so Steinberg. Yeah, I've got a girlfriend. He, he, in order for his kids to, I mean, I'm assuming he could probably afford it, but in order for his kids to get the camp free tuition, Steinberg is the camp doctor for three weeks, three of the seven. So he goes out there? So he he's currently in upstate New York, correct? And, and, and like, again, what is like, this camp like? Heavy outdoors? I oh, assume? it's like canoeing, and you know they've got a basketball division, and like he's really good friends with the basketball coach, who was a guy that had played in Europe and, and his best. Okay, how about this? To put it into a sports talk Indianapolis standpoint, so Dave is working this camp, and one of the counselors at the camp is the guy that coaches the basketball aspect of the camp. So if you go to this camp each day, you know, you do basketball clinic for two hours and then you canoe and then you learn archery, you know, whatever. The guy that teaches basketball is a former professional player that played in Europe, had a cup of coffee in the NBA, and he is like best friends with and former roommates with Terrence Stansberry, who was the first ever pacer to partake in the slam dunk contest. Uh, but at any rate, like I'm on the phone with Steinberg the other day and we're talking. And as we're talking, I can hear this woman saying something to Steinberg. And then he says to me, eh, check it out, dude. Eh, I've got like a kid with a head injury and like he had to leave. And so go, but so can you imagine what, how that kid feels to know that that's what the doctor's talking <laughs> like? That's about to look at you neurologically. Yeah, that's uh, that would be disturbing. <laughs> yeah, uh huh, to say the least. Nothing against Dr. Steinberg credentials. I'm sure they're tremendous, but it, it, it's funny you say that, Jake. I felt this way about those congressional hearings yesterday with the PJ Tour and Live. Um, they have access to like all of the e- <coughs> Excuse me. They have access to like all the emails and the WhatsApp text messages. And just their text in general, and they're pretty much airing all of this out there. And it is wild to me to see how like really famous rich people communicate. And you have like at one point, yeah, I can't get my WhatsApp call to work. Sorry about that. Are you having issues too? I'm like, they're just like one of us. That's right. They're they're doing a Zoom call and one person can't get their camera on and Literally. there's no audio and yeah. Yeah, Microsoft Teams isn't working today, so uh, yeah, that's where, uh, that's where they're at in that. Bailey wants to go. <laughs> Anthony Richardson to score 10-plus rushing touchdowns in the ra- regular season. Are you in on that or I'd no? I'd go under. Yeah, 10 rushing touchdowns? Yeah, that's I mean, plus, that's, a, that's a lot. plus 600, folks. That is tremendous odds. How many did Jalen Hurts have last year? That's what, 10 bucks to win 60? We know we know where Jalen Hurts had one of oh them. Oh, my God. <laughs> We we know where he had one. We got to get Rick Venturi on when we're up at camp. See if he can uh, reenact that. Jalen Hurts this past season in rushing touchdowns. Good lord, I can't even read these stats. <laughs> well, is this like the MLB page when you were on the advanced stats page <laughs> when you're supposed to be on? Who the needs reg- the BIP stats? I got them right here. The regular stats page. I, I mean. Is your brain melting right no. now? No, this is all. It's all. Are we passing not finding yards. it? There's, on the on the NFL website, it's all passing yards. I don't see his rushing. I've got 13 rushing touchdowns for, for Jalen Hurts. Hurts okay, year. well that's. Was he the leader for quarterbacks? I have to imagine he was. Given Lamar's injury situation, I would think. Yeah, I. I that's why it's plus 600. I mean, that's, that's still a lot. That's a lot also considering that we don't know, even though I think it's going to be early. I think it's going to be – it could be week one. We don't know how many games he's going to play. We don't know Wait, when he gets this is another wild there. one. Everyone is sending me their, their degenerate bets right now, right? <laughs> because you're t- talking about Patri- Pacers future bets. They're like, I'll send it this How guy. about this one? I actually kind of like this one. This is from uh, Patrick, all right? The Colts to throw for one passing touchdown, at least, in every regular season game this year. Okay, so they need to have one throwing touchdown in every game this season. Those odds are plus twenty thousand. 
Patrick has wagered five bucks to win a thousand. Well, if it's part of my naivete here again, it, it, plus twenty thousand. Correct. Uh huh. So it's obviously a huge long shot that the Colts achieve this. But Patrick has put down five dollars to win one thousand dollars, and he needs the Colts to throw for at least one touchdown in where, every game. Where are you making these bets at? I, this is a a betting app, Mark, that you you are familiar with. I'll oh, just okay. leave it at that. Okay. Plus twenty thousand. Again, I'm going to sound like an idiot. Wouldn't that be plus two hundred? No, that'd be plus. No, twenty thousand is. Let me think. Plus twenty thousand would mean you bet. Uh, so you yeah, bet a hundred dollars. Five, bu- five bucks at t- plus twenty thousand. Yeah, five bucks at plus twenty thousand is a thousand dollar payout. Okay, so so a hundred dollars would be a twenty thousand dollar payout. I see. Yeah. Okay. Do you? I mean, do we like it? I mean, for five bucks, what, you know, that's that's like going in and buying a. Now, bag Jack- of chips and a Coke at the grocery store, sure. Jacksonville, you know, 20 to 3 in the season opener against the Colts. And, well, it was fun while it lasted, Rick Carlisle, right? <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> oh, boy. You're uh, right. I mean, now that you think about it, there are games where, you know, a, a 12 to 9 game or. Well, how they, about if you score 10 points in a game and your one touchdown well, rushing touchdown? What if you go into the final game of the year, and I, I don't have their schedule in front of me, but. If they go into the final game of the year and it's in snow-covered Buffalo, what do you do then? You know what I mean? Things like that. I mean, there are those those factors come into play for sure. Yeah, I know. I said this when the schedule came out in May. I mean, you look at the Colts' schedule. I think the over/under is Has around. Has there seven ever and been a half. season where the Colts have done that? Oh, I'd venture to guess one of the Peyton years, right? Oh, yeah. I'm sure. I mean, the year he threw 49, for yeah. sure, right? Now, if you say it like that, well, yeah, that one time when Peyton threw 49 touchdowns, they did. Exactly. And it's like, uh, well, that's why it's $5 to win 1000 But you talk about some rooting interest each week? I would have you there. Now, granted, maybe you know, a large section of our audience probably doesn't need necessarily that rooting interest. But again, that cold schedule, to me, I think it's one of the least daunting I've seen entering a season in quite some time. We'll talk a little baseball coming up in about 10 minutes. Will Carroll joins us to preview the second half of the season. It is a sunny and it is a humid nice. start to this Wednesday morning here in Indy. Kevin and Corey, 93.5, 107.5, The Fan. Oh Possession into the end zone God. for us. And now a special...
Kevin and Quarry on 93.5 and 107.5. The Fan. Okay, I'm going to ask a question uh, for you guys, but also, I, I guess, my parents. Or, or sounding like my parents, I mean, for our listeners. You ready? How's this internet work? <laughs> Pretty similar to that. So I'm on one of the popular social media sites, and up pops a thing saying, like, don't miss out on this sale on running shoes from Dick's Sporting Goods. It looks totally legit. You click on it, and it looks like it goes to the Dick's Sporting Goods website. And then you go on it, and you're like, wow, like running shoes for 20 bucks? That seems too good to be true. This is clearly like a, a phishing scam, right? Well, I would say as long as your computer didn't blow up and a porn site didn't pop up, I think you're good to go. You think so? What What do they give you, like a promo code, or what's the... It doesn't give you, it just says, um, but here's the thing. So it's Asics running shoes, which are good running shoes. So you like online shopping here? You click on it, but then the website that you go to, it's ASCStoreUS.com. And at the bottom. sound like Dick Sporting Goods. Right. And at the bottom of it, though, it says 2020, copyright 2023 Dick Sporting Goods. Like, this is like the most legit looking website. I don't know, man. I've clicked on stuff like that before and I'm. You know, I've that, gotten the I've gotten the stuff. That delivered. guy in his mom's basement right now is smiling ear to ear, thinking Jake Query. Yeah, now this is got him. I'm telling you though, you click on the contact us, and it's email Dobby at autmoose.com. Yeah, this has to be fake, right? Give the, that email address sounds pretty real. One more time on that one. <laughs> <laughs> sounded real legit. Here we go. Somebody just said, com. "I've been there. It's a scam. Don't do it." See that? That's the beauty. Thank you. That's the beauty hey, of our listeners. They got you to click. That's People all that matters. People are smarter than me. You're right. Scammers like you know how I'm going to get this jQuery. I'm going to put some mm-hmm. Asics running shoes. That'll get them. So now, mm-hmm. like a thou, I'm going to get like a thousand emails, right? Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh, your phone's heard everything you've Bots said. So everywhere. now, when you go on your Threads account, you're going to get all you know, Dick Sporting Goods, running shoes. Here's Reeboks. Here's some Pumas for you. We've got trackside tonight, 7 o'clock. Jake is off to Toronto coming up this weekend as, boy, Jake, does it ramp up for you this week, right? Yeah, because we go back-to-back, back, right? Five races in four weeks. I think that's right, yeah. We've got the doubleheader in Iowa coming up next weekend. And then, is it Nashville Indy? Is that the order? Go back to Nashville for a second year? Co- correct. Indies. The Brickyard weekend, of course. Probably a month from, like, today. That's right. I think it's August 16th, isn't it? Yeah. Pull up the old calendar here. Uh, August 12th, right? August 12th is a Saturday. That's a, There you go. Uh, so, yeah, it's going to be busy from an IndyCar standpoint. Jake, I know you mentioned this in the opener, but I think it's worth double backing on. Um, I know the IMS Museum is a popular visit site for a whole lot of people, but it's going to be closed for about 18 months coming up this fall. and. Care to uh, explain a little bit more on that front? Yeah, so they're basically going to, if you've been into the Indianapolis Motor Speedway Hall of Fame Museum, you know, as of right now, it while they have great displays and great cars and everything else, it basically looks the same as it did if you'd been there 30 years ago. And they're going to do a more, just basically a completely modernized overhaul of it. When you walk in, the main area will be almost like an atrium with multiple levels uh, the ceiling will be, I'm trying to think of the wording, that I'm, almost like a virtual reality of the flyover at the begin, beginning of the race. Uh, they will have, I think, more interactive displays, you know, especially for younger people that are used to touch screens and, and video aspects. I think they're probably going to have an area where, like, the audio is enhanced to give you the true sounds of race cars and the speed of it all. So I have always said the... The gold standard for me of these kinds of museums is the Barber Motorsports Park Museum. The Vintage Motorsports Museum at Barber Motorsports Park is fabulous. It's multiple levels, and you could eat up the floor of it, and I think that that's one of them that they, uh, Joe Hale and the group over at the Speedway Museum, have looked long and hard at that to try to replicate. And again... Different entity than the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. They simply leased the building and the space inside the Speedway to do the museum. Should be good. Should uh, be Lily cool. Endowment 
a huge contribution to this. I still think they are a ways away from getting to the full. Was it eighty nine million or eighty six million? Eighty nine million. Yep. Eighty nine million for the renovation. But again, starting this November through April twenty twenty five. So uh, you obviously not be able to go there during the month of May. Coming up in twenty twenty four, the IMS Museum will be closed. Speaking of museums, I know we got Cooperstown coming up in a few weeks. Second half of the Major League Baseball season gets underway coming up on Friday. Five of the six division races extremely close leading here into the midway point of July. We'll talk with Will Carroll on the other side. The injury expert joins us next here. Kevin Aquari, 93.5, 107.5, the fan. An inquiry on 93.5 and 107.5. The fan. Stat still is pretty crazy to me, Jake. As Major League Baseball gets underway coming up on Friday, ESPN had this. You have five of the six divisions where the first place team has a two game lead or smaller heading into the second half. That is the most divisions with that small of a lead over the second-place team at the All-Star break since Major League Baseball went to six divisions in 94. Is there any one specific thing above something else that you would attribute that to? Is it because... I guess the follow-up question would be, like, are the, have the games been closer this year? I don't know. I, I think part of it may be the way pitching is utilized now. There are... Bail on your starter earlier? Like, yeah, like pitching is more spread out. Like pitching talent is more is spread more thin. Does that make sense? Let's ask Will Carroll this. Will Carroll joins us now again at the Injury Expert on Twitter. Will, any explanation for why we have such competitive divisional races 
heading into the second half of the year, more so than other years? Uh, yeah, uh, you know, basically, I, I think Jake was on the right track. Is we're seeing fewer and fewer uh, pitching dominant teams, largely because of injury. Uh, but secondarily, we're seeing a lot of mediocrity. You know, there is no great team out there that's just running away with things. There's no team that's dominant. Um, there, there are some very good teams, but mostly you could you could basically say every team's at 500 and throw a blanket over most of them. You know, we've got whole divisions under 500. Uh, we've got whole divisions over 500, but not by much. I think what we're seeing is the competitive balance that everybody says Major League Baseball doesn't have. You know, Will, I look at some teams like Kansas City, okay? Mm -hmm. And I know it's been a few years, but Kansas City had bright young stars. You know, you saw them break through and win a World Series. I I assume at that point, was it that Kansas City, just from a financial structure, didn't have the money to, to, to retain the young talent that they had when they won the World Series? Or did they basically just undergo like a, you know what? We're not going to be able to get these guys. So let's just let's just tear down and rebuild and do it all over again. I mean, how does a team go that quickly from penthouse back to outhouse? Well, I mean, we've seen the opposite with the Reds and the Pirates this year. So, you know, if you look back, that was really a fluke team. They weren't that good before. They weren't that good after. They were really well managed. They had an absolutely dominant bullpen, and bullpens have a lot of turnover. I mean, think about the players that led that team. Uh, I, Eric Hosmer. Uh, Mike Moustakis, these aren't superstars. They're, you know, they're not far out of the game. I mean, uh, Hosmer was just let go last month. It was just everything went right for the Royals. You know, I don't think losing Eric Hosmer it tore down that team. Um, you know, Lorenzo K, they just didn't have a ton of stars. The one guy who's held over is Salvador Perez, and he's been good the whole time. The, the fact is Kansas City's just been mismanaged, and we'll have to see whether – ownerships trying to get rid of Royal or Kauffman stadium uh, and move downtown is going to throw everything off. Or, you know, here's the other thing that that just fascinates me is that Patrick Mahomes owns 10% of that team. (laughs) You know, on the day when quarterback comes out on Netflix, uh, Mahomes has been very quiet about that. I'm curious if he's always going to be like that um, or or whether he'll get involved, but uh, Kansas city is just kind of an irrelevant team right now. And that's sad. It is because it's a great, I mean, great stadium, pretty good fan base. You know, I've always kind of liked them. But let's go to, as you had mentioned, kind of their National League equivalent from an organizational standpoint or market size, and that is the Reds. I have always felt, Will, that oftentimes teams that have breakthrough years or, or dream seasons, it's because three or four utility-type players all have career years simultaneously. 260 batters become 285 batters all at the same time, and and things just click, right? And then everything comes back down to earth. This Cincinnati team, they have arrived early. Is that because players that are not going to be able to sustain it are having dream seasons, or because young players that this was expected out of have all arrived at the same time? Um, I, I don't know that we can expect what we've seen from guys like Abbott and McLean and Ellie Dela Cruz, who really needs a good nickname. Um, you know, I, I just don't know. I can take a look at Ellie Dela Cruz and, and know that we had ridiculous expectations for him. But did I expect this? No, I don't think anybody did. I think what we have to look at is two things here. The first is that Nick Crawl is a genius. I mean, he's been part of this team for, for a number of years. Ownership is hugely problematic. I mean, it was just last year that the Castellinis were like, where else are you going to go? Uh, they're not spending money. We'll see whether they get involved in the trade market. They need at least one pitcher, uh, if not two. So we'll have to see. But yeah, good young players being allowed to play uh, is pretty good. They don't have anybody that's you know super over their head. At this stage, and there's still a lot of problems. Um, you know, they, this is a team that should be good for a long time. And this is the one where I stare really, really hard at the ownership and say, this one's on you. Uh, you know, you might have the, the cheapest ownership in baseball, and you have a chance right now to win a World Series. 
you know, you would know this, Will. Will Carroll's our guest, the injury expert. He's on the Payless Sickers Hotline. I wanted you to be able to explain this because you have been involved in these sorts of um, technologies, I guess. What mm-hmm. was it when De La Cruz hit the home run and there was question about what was on the butt of his bat? And my understanding yeah. is it's like some sort of a tracking device. Take me mm-hmm. through what it was that was on his bat, what wasn't there that made it legal, and what the intention of all of it is. So it's what he had on the bottom of his bat was basically a, a, a plastic or rubber piece that goes over the knob of the bat and holds a sensor underneath the bat. Uh, they're legal to be used at the major league level, so I don't know what the question was. Um, major League Baseball has partnered with Blast Motion, who makes that sensor. Um, for him, it's just he was more comfortable with it. Uh, he did it all the way through the minors where they were collecting data. At the major league level, he didn't have the sensor, but he liked He was just used to it, whether that rubber was some sort of cushion against the knob. Uh, but uh, that's all it was. It, it was fully legal. But the and it's legal to have the sensor in during the game as well, or just to have the device that holds the sensor. Both. Um, no one actually uses sensors at the major league level because, uh, unfortunately, the players' association uh, disagrees with the use of it. Uh, teams using the data, they they're scared they would use it against them in arbitration. Uh, so no one actually uses it in game. Uh, so it's sad because there's a lot of stuff we could be tracking that uh, we don't. Get that it's, one's on the players. It's, uh, at the injury expert on Twitter, Will Carroll uh, joins us here. Always enjoy our baseball combos with Will. Um, I want to stick with the Reds for just a second. You brought up Nick Crawl, their general manager. How much of a buyer should they be in the next couple of weeks? They, they should be. I mean, the, there's two problems. First off, uh, is ownership going to allow them to go out there and buy? Uh, they they ha- they should have the cash. I mean, this is a, a billionaire ownership group. People always say, "Oh, the Castellinis aren't that rich." I'm like, "But you've got 25 owners. You know, total them up, and you're you're as good as anybody else." Um, you know, they're profitable right now, just off the TV money. Uh, you're seeing them get sellout after sellout. Winning does that. Um, so he should be able to go out. The question is, what's he going to be able to get? Uh, there's not a lot of sellers. Uh, there were people talking about Zach Grinky. Does he have anything left? I think the White Sox are going to be the ones that actually do sell. Um, and I think the best move they could make would be to swap somebody. They've got a ton of shortstops. It sure looks like that Dela Cruz kid is going to stick. Uh, they've got one at Louisville called Noel V. Marte, who they got in the Luis Castillo deal last year. They could flip him now and easily get somebody like Lucas Giolito or Brownsburg's own Lance Lynn. Uh, who would really, really help that team? You bring up De La Cruz and you know Joey Votto. This is probably a couple weeks ago now. Compared him to Mickey Mantle, and, and at first I'm thinking to myself, what in the world? Yeah. But then I'm like, you know what? I don't think Votto just says stuff just to say it. He strikes me as a guy that has an unbelievable high regard for the history of the game of baseball, mm-hmm. and he basically was saying, you know, from a switch hitting power speed combination. That's what he sees in De La Cruz. When you yeah. hear that, do you just say hyperbole to the nth degree or what? No, no. I mean, I think the problem is there's just not many players like that. Switch hitting, 500 home run hitting, uh, stealing a ton of bases. Mantle wasn't a great stealer because of his knee injuries. But um, there's just not many people you can compare him to. Uh, so that's the one. You know, you're certainly not going to compare him to Chipper Jones. Um so I, I think, yeah, the mantle comparison is apt in the tools. It's a question of, you know, does he stay healthy? Does yeah. he stay motivated? Does, you know, he's super young. He's super talented. He's still filling out. I mean, if you ever see the videos of when they signed this kid, I think he's Sammy Sosa. And, and you know, a, a kid who filled out, who they saw power in him somehow. Scouts are magicians sometimes. Uh, and, and I, I really think that Sosa comparison is the one. Hey, Will, I, we mentioned this yesterday, and I'm really curious your thought on it. Willie Mays is, and I'm going to make a definitive statement, which is always mm-hmm. dangerous because you, you know what I mean, but I think definitively we can say that amongst baseball people, Willie Mays is regarded as the greatest living player. Would you agree with that? Yes. 
Okay. Or his godson, one of the two. So, well, that was what I was going to ask you is, so, and, and re, you know, God love him. I hope it goes for another 20 years. But he's 92 years old. Yeah. When Willie Mays is no longer with us, who inherits the title of greatest living baseball player? Barry Bonds. I mean, there's. if you have a question about that, uh, I mean, you can take – just his pirates career and he would probably have it so, i know and that's uh, and and i think for so many people will that's what is so and i get it i mean i'm not sitting here trying to indict the guy he, he, but mm-hmm. i think the thing about bonds with the peds that is so intriguing or fascinating is the fact that he is one guy that was still a hall of fame five tool yeah. player even before any of that Exactly. And if honestly, I think if it, if you don't want to go with Bonds, then it's not just a living player, it's a current player. I mean, Shohei Otani is doing things that we've never Yeah, we mentioned Otani, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. For, for, forget Babe Ruth. He's better than Babe Ruth, uh, at least on season over season basis. Maybe he hasn't hit uh, 60 home runs yet, but uh, we're only at the All Star break. Uh, this guy is going to get the biggest contract in Major League Baseball history. He's doing things we've never seen. You know, night after night after night, he is doing things. And it, it, it's kind of ridiculous because there's, I forget who it was, but it's like uh, the the tweet was, you know, every night uh, Trout and, and Otani are doing things that haven't been done since 1911, and yet the Angels are losing 6-2. Uh, so I just hope he escapes uh, and goes someplace where he can win a championship. I was going to say, he gets that biggest contract with who? The easy answer is the Dodgers, um, but there's some interesting places. Could the Giants do it? They showed they could do a big contract with Carlos Correa, and that fell apart due, due to the medicals. Uh, certainly the Seattle fans made their uh, uh, feelings known, and Seattle uh, certainly could. There's some Japanese ownership there that might help. Um, any team could. That's the thing that I keep going back to is that any team could. Um but it, I think he'll stay West Coast. I think it's the Dodgers. Uh, but uh, I hope it's intriguing. I, I hope there's a lot of teams that did. Will, I got two last ones here. And again, Will Carroll is with us. Um, just universally, how would you say the rule changes have been viewed from Major League Baseball this year and, and fans? Yeah, I think pitch clock has been good, but we're also seeing more injuries. You know, I'm publishing a thing this morning on injury trends and, you know, Oblique strains are through the roof. We have more of those this year through the All-Star break than we did the last two years combined. Uh, we're seeing more pitching arm injuries. You know, elbow injuries are slightly down. Uh, I saw ESPN quoted that Tommy John was down 20%. Well, that's because we've got a new operation that people are doing where we repair the ligament rather than replace it. Um, we're, we're getting better non-surgical options, but I'll have a lot of details. You can go to underthenife.substack.com and sign up for that. Uh, that'll be out free later today. Um, the steals, I don't know. Yes, it's exciting, but does Ellie De La Cruz steal three bases under last year's rules? Probably. Um, it hasn't made as big a difference. And the shift, the, the, the shift ban hasn't made a bit of difference. It's just dumb at this stage. So um, what, what disappointed me, because we're not going to the automated balls and strikes. If anybody's gone out to Victory Seals and seen either of the two systems that they use, I think they work really, really well, and I think they should be in Major League Baseball today. Hey, okay, Will. And the, uh, sorry, Go I just got one last one, and this is Max Clark related to the number three overall pick earlier this mm, week yeah. by the Detroit Tigers. Uh, have you seen him play or oh, yeah. from people that you have talked to uh, any sort of Major League Baseball comp for Max Clark? Ooh, um, yeah, I mean, he's really good. And in a lot of years, he'd have been the first overall pick. Um, I think the one I saw this weekend that I liked a lot, and, you know, all you had to do was go to a Franklin game, and you could see 10 Major League GMs sitting there. Um, It was scouts and radar guns aplenty. Uh, Such a good kid. Uh, I I think the Tigers uh, got a heck of a guy. I would actually compare him to Corbin Carroll. Uh, the Diamondbacks all-star, uh, you know, not a huge guy, but surprising power, good speed. Uh, and Corbin Carroll's a guy who slid in the draft a couple of years ago uh, and is already in the major leagues. All-star uh, could be an MVP candidate. So I don't think it's going to take long to see Clark. I can't wait to 
drive up to uh, Comerica Park, which I think is the most underrated park in Major League Baseball. Yeah, it's a good park. Uh, and see him play. I think he'll be there in three years. You know, Will, I, I wanted to go back real quick to something else you just mentioned because I think 95% of our listeners have heard the term Tommy John surgery. Yeah. And 20% probably even know what that is. So let me give you my layman terms, you know, 31 years to complete college definition of Tommy John surgery, and then you tell me if it's in the ballpark. Well, thanks. Um, I do appreciate that. But so Tommy John surgery is when a guy has a problem with his elbow because the ligament's worn out, so they find a ligament from either elsewhere in his body or from somebody who's donated one, and they put it in his elbow. Am I close? Yeah, you're absolutely correct. Okay, so it's just that – I guess the other question would become if it is transferring a ligament from one's own body, where do we have like excess ligament? Um, There's two. Uh, The original was done with the palmaris. Um, If you put your thumb and ring finger together, you'll see it pop up um, on your wrist. And that, that one's redundant. The other one that's used more just because it's bigger is a hamstring ligament. Uh, you, you, you take this, that off, uh, and it, it, it basically has two attachment points. So it's a little weaker, but it thickens right back up. Interesting. There you go. Well, I lied. Mark chimed in here and and brought up the Shaquille Leonard situation. Uh, Jim Mercer's comments from earlier in the week, certainly not a ringing endorsement on Shaquille Leonard being fully cleared when the Colts open up camp two weeks from today. We'll see exactly where he's at for their first practice coming up in two weeks. Uh, Does that surprise you at all? What what are your thoughts on a guy that's had two back surgeries in the last 13 months? And yeah, it's certainly worrisome. You know, is it a back injury? Is it a leg injury? What the heck is it? And why can't they fix it? He's gone to some of the best back surgeons in the world. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, there's a lot of things I can say about the Colts medical staff uh, and their results over the last decade, but this is one that's really worrisome because that defense changes. Uh, you could see it last year, how much they missed Leonard. Uh, he, he's such a difference maker on the field, whether it's causing fumbles or just the way he goes uh sideline to sideline virtually so having him back in any capacity would be good but if we've lost him i don't want him to be the next bob sanders and that's what it's feeling like right now again it is at the injury expert under the knife uh sub stack that's where you can find his latest you said oblique trends coming out tomorrow uh coming out uh in about 10 minutes oh perfect you can check that out again under the knife dot substack dot com well thanks man i appreciate it thanks a lot guys that is Will Carroll, the injury expert there on Twitter. Always has great baseball insight. Boy, you mentioned you mentioned Bob Sanders' name, and all of a sudden it's like, whoa, wait a minute. So we've got Ring of Honor Colts announcement on Monday. Did I see that? So who are you guessing it would be? The, the three that immediately jump out are Sanders, Dallas Clark, and Adam Vinatieri. Am I missing anybody? Sanders would be interesting just because, I mean, the dude just doesn't – show up places. You yeah, know when was the last time we saw him yeah, publicly? Yeah, yeah, I actually had a conversation with him at uh, the Hall of Fame induction for Marvin and Tony. That would have been whatever that was, 20, I don't know, 16, something like that. And I was shocked, like, just walking away from that conversation being like, wait, this dude has, like, been in hibernation and continues to be in hibernation, I guess, since. I mean, it was a great conversation, engaging. He was chatting with fans as well. Uh, of those three, who do you think? Sanders, Clark, or is it in that order, you Sanders, Clark, terms Vinatieri? Of which one do I think will get in or which one is most deserving? Well, I guess both. Again, we've had Peyton, we've had Reggie, we've had Dwight, you know, you know, had they, Marvin, they, Mathis, here's what's, here's what's interesting. The three of them represent three different reasons why they should go in. Vinatieri because he won them games and is the most – from a national standpoint, accomplished and famous of the three. Clark, because he was a dynamic player and one that probably was unheralded during the time that he was doing things because of the other players on the field. And Sanders, because he's the most popular player not named Peyton Manning in franchise history locally, I I believe. I mean, who would be – Edron's up there. Yeah, I do think Reggie's got a big – Reggie Falling. Wayne's up there, but Bob Sanders, man, I'm telling you, like, there's something about that dude. People, he's like a mythical figure. He is literally a mythical figure. Every market, Kevin has has the guy that other markets don't realize how popular they were. 
Willa McGee in St. Louis is the one that, that always jumps out at me. And Bob Sanders is that guy in Indy. Yeah, I almost think, when I think mythical figure, I think Jonathan Bender. Like, we know that Sanders could do it. I mean, he, hell, he was the defensive player of the no, year. No, I get it. but It was just staying power but I, but and longevity. Mythical figure, by now, in, in terms of now, I mean, though, because people don't know whether he is still 5'8", 205, or is he now 5'8", and 160. I, you know what I mean? I mean, nobody sees him. He was, He's not around. He certainly has found the weight room, at least he did when I last saw him, but who knows? Which of those three gets the bigger crowd uh, reaction? Bob Sanders. Bob Sanders? Yeah, yeah for sure. I'd, I'd venture that way, too. Yeah, easily. On that end, did you realize um, how close to White Franey and Michael Jordan are? Did you Did you know any of that? Really? Super close. Um, Where did that form? I, I guess you could just enter, like, well, I, I correct me if I'm wrong, but isn't Franey a Jordan brand athlete? Is that it? I, I think that maybe where some of it is, but where it currently is, is they are both huge golfers. Uh, Jordan opened up a crazy exclusive golf course in Florida called the Grove 23, and Freeney and him are like always, sounds like, partners and boys, and he's going to Rome with Jordan for the Ryder Cup coming up here in September. Uh, so Dwight was always a huge golfer. Um, particularly, I think, in its later stages here in Indianapolis, and now that he's in retirement, that's been a big, big deal. And I think we, it's pretty well documented the Jordan golf story. So, yeah, sounds like they are. You know, real hopefully tight. he's not betting with him on the golf course. And, um, well, Jordan doesn't pay, right? Well, that's, yeah, so he's getting it. In regards to play, as somebody who, who covered that entire era, I was working at Channel 6 for the almost the entirety of it. The guy that I think people would be surprised was, in my opinion, the most pleasant to cover was Freeney. I always thought he was a nice guy. Really yeah, agreed. I, I always soft, enjoyed my conversations. Soft spoken, but when you talk to him, always had a big smile, eager to talk, nice guy. Uh, you know, insightful, expansive, smart. Yeah, l- always liked him. Liked him a great deal. Yeah. So again, that Ring of Honor announcement will um, be coming here. I believe on Monday, Joel says Charles Oakley and Michael Jordan would come down and play Wolf Run with Dwight Franey back in the day. Wow. That'd be a hell of a. Now, Wolf watch. Run's gone, right? Correct. Yeah. It's, um, I think it's turned into some sort of like wildlife nature preserve in Zionsville. Oh, should be for wolves, right? Let for them the run there. Out there. Well, yeah. Uh, now, if they did your... the same thing with Bear Slide, that'd be interesting. Who's your halt? He asks, does Dominic Rhodes ever get the nod? No. I mean, at some point you got to Everybody knows line. Dominic Rhodes was the Super Bowl MVP, and that's enough for yeah, him. Yeah, that's, again, this is the ring of honor. This is not the, not the WWE Hall of Fame. Underrated like cult that deserved. Coco beware and move on. <laughs> <laughs> the pop quiz is coming up in a few. Uh, Eagles and Steely Dan coming up uh, October 9th. That is a pair of tickets to whoever gets on air. Doesn't have to win the pop quiz today. So phone lines are open now. 317-239-1070 for that. Uh, let's lead off the morning check down with the MLB All-Star Game. The morning check down. Omaha! 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 On 93.5 and 107.5 The Fan. National League was trying to snap a nine-game losing skid in the All-Star game, and when it came down to it, they had to dial up the services and rely on them from a guy that played for the Indianapolis Indians. Here's how it sounded. The 2-2. Swing and a high fly ball. Left field. That one back. That one way back there. God! Elias Diaz, a home run! And the National League has taken a 3-2 lead as he blasts that one out to left. And that was the final, 3-2. By the way, Mitch Keller of the Pirates, also a former Indianapolis Indian, got into pitching innings last time. I was kind of rooting for the tie. I I was rooting for the little home run derby swing off there that we could have gotten had the AL stuck one in there in the bottom of the ninth. But Craig Kimbrell overcame a couple walks, struck out Jose Ramirez for the W. All right, today, speaking of the W, it would be the WNBA. The Fever have got one more game until a week-long break. Much needed. Uh, for the All-Star break for the WNBA. It's a noon tip over at Gamebridge Fieldhouse. That is with the New York Liberty. And then the Fever are off until next Wednesday. 
If you're looking for NBA action tonight, the Pacers, game three of the Summer League, 7.30 with the Thunder. Not sure about Chet Holmgren and his status for the Thunder, but we do know the Pacers will be sitting their veteran guys on the Summer League roster. So Benedict Mather and Andrew Nemhard, Isaiah Jackson, uh, head to Caesars and enjoy Vegas, right? Man, how awesome would that be? Just hang out, soak in a little basketball, you go get yourself some fat burger at about 3 in the morning on the Strip. Life's good. By the way, tonight, 7.30 on the pitch in San Diego, it is uh, the United States and Panama in the Gold Cup of the tournament. I always forget how to say it, and I don't want to offend people. CONCACAF. CONCACAF. I just, I have like a, it's like, is it Doperak? No. Oh, Dopirak, right? Time. Dustin Dopirak. I thought, I, you're, I, I thought you're friends with him now, didn't you? I like, sat next sat to him. Next with the, you know what? He was very cool because I said to him, I'm like, look, man, I, I, I'm i not trying to disrespect you. I just, for whatever reason, that word, it's weird. And he's like, I totally get it, man. I've dealt with it my whole life. Okay. Which I yeah, thought was should, cool. You've seen the text he sent me on the side after that <laughs> conversation. <laughs> Story of my life, Kevin. Story of my life. Pop quiz is next. 317-239-107.
Man. Have you studied? Can you handle the pressure? Sharpen your pencils. It's time for the pop quiz with Kevin and Query. Brought to you by Jiffy Lube, Indiana's favorite oil change since 1985. You know, I got to thinking about this. It's 9.30 and we're doing the pop quiz, right? Yep. And yesterday at 9.30, what did we do? The same thing. And what did we do on, on Friday at 9.30? The same thing. Isn't a pop quiz supposed to mean a quiz that you don't know is coming? Mm-hmm. Wasn't that the point in school where it was like, like, oh, pop quiz, meaning they pop it up on you unexpectedly? This should be called the scheduled quiz, right? I just uh, ventured over to the vending machine that we have here. Uh-huh. It seems rather outrageous to me that a candy bar of Reese's is a dollar fifty, but yet the bag of peanut butter pretzels is a dollar twenty-five. What's more outrageous, the pretzels or the? I think the pretzels well, should be worth it's more. Outrageous. I don't know. The Reese's is pretty coveted. Now, when I worked at Channel 6 one day, th- there was a screw-up. Kevin Gregory, I've never seen him more excited in my life. They accidentally put an entire rack of Baby Ruths in the 35-cent mint section. <laughs> the Baby Ruths were 35 cents. He's Literally. breaking down the vending machine. Ah, <laughs> oh, let me tell you something. We, we went... We went hog change, wild I need on that. Change. Now I did have one. Can't time. go on air, guys. L- now, let me ask you this, Kevin Gregory's son, by the way, a Notre Dame basketball product. I one time went down to the vending machine, and then we'll get to the pop quiz here. Vending machine hijinks. I went down to the vending machine at Channel Six uh, to buy a soda, okay, soft drink, Coke, whatever you want to call it. They were a dollar, I think, or dollar fifty, whatever. I put it in and realized that I was a dime short. I'd miscalculated my desk change. I was a dime short. So I ran right upstairs to go get an extra dime, came back, and one of the on-air personalities is walking around drinking a soft drink. And I said, hey, did you just buy that? And he said, yeah. And believe it or not, it was only 10 cents. (laughs) And I said, (laughs) sorry about you. Well, actually, da-da-da-da-da. And then the person denied it. No, I was just kidding. It wasn't. I, I paid. Got to have some surveillance, do we not? And would not confess to the fact that they bought it for that they that they were being serious and bought it for a dime, and would not give me my like I help. Kind of like George that. Costanza's Twix story. That's what that was. <laughs> yeah, I won't say the name uh, of who it was, but he was a oh, huge Ohio on. State fan. It is, it's He's retired. Lineup. He's retired now. But I've never, I never looked at him the same after that. I'm like, there's that. SOB that's got my 10 cent. It's easy now. Yeah. Easy now. All right. All right. Who do we have here? Uh, we'll go number one through six. Uh, yeah. Let's go with number three, Mark. Beth. 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 Hi there. Beth, how are you? I'm doing good. How are you? Beth, did you call for the tickets because you wanted to just entertain the pop yes. quiz with Jake and I? Oh, I want the tickets. Oh, God. Well, I respect <laughs> your honesty, Beth. Beth. I-, I think you've called the program before, right, Beth? Um, I may have tried, but I don't know if I've ever gotten Because we, we don't have, you're literally the second female listener in the history Again, of this I don't program. even know if she's a listener. She said she just yeah, called for right. the Demographically tickets. speaking, I'm thrilled over this. Can we play Get to Know Your Listener, Beth? It's a, we have a wild, lot of success with this pro, with this on the program. Have you played Get to Know Your Listener? I have not. Are you familiar with Get to Know Your Listener? No. Do you know what show you've called into? Yeah, 1070. Okay. Oh, it used to be, Beth. Beth, how how often do you hear this program in the morning? Oh, once a week. Okay. And and what line of work are you in, Beth? Or, or are you... I work for a concrete company. Oh, really? Oh. I do. Cool. Okay. Um, they like to mix things up over there, right? We do. That's okay. <laughs> Uh, Beth, no sympathy laughs are needed for that one. Beth, when you were in high school, if you went to your high school basketball game and you were cheering for your team, you were yelling, go what? Like Eagles, Rockets, Bulldogs, what was it? Warriors. Warriors, okay. Dub C, Warren Central? Warren Central, baby. Let's go. Okay, and that would have been, did they have good football teams when you were in school, Beth? They did. Um, I graduated in 86 with Jeff George. That was uh, you had some pretty good teams, eighty five and eighty six, back to back state champions, correct? We were. All right. Well, Beth, I appreciate you participating in this, and we certainly hope that you enjoy it. Are you more excited about Steely Dan or the Eagles? The Eagles. And do you have a favorite Eagles song? All of them. Wow. So you're a big Eagles <laughs> oh, fan, that's huh? Be great. Jeff George, by the way, Jeff George's favorite band is Journey. Was Journey big when you were at Warren Central? 
Yeah, they were big, probably, yeah. Was that a joke or was that serious? No, I'm being serious. Like, Jeff George and I have had that conversation in his favorite bandage journey. Sorry, I should have pointed that out. Okay. Uh, all right. Uh, he used uh, to like to walk around eating a hot Sam pretzel at Washington Square Washington Mall. Square? And, oh, yeah. Heck yeah. <laughs> okay, Beth, would you like for me, that would be Jake, to lead you off with question number one, or would you like for Kevin to lead you off with question number one? Jake, because that's my son's name. Oh, really? Okay. <laughs> Not named for his dad, I hope. Okay, here we go. Uh, question number one. Oh, my God, that just got awkward. <laughs> <What is> Jeez. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, Jake, oh. is is Jake actually his real name, or is that a nickname? It's Jacob. Yeah, I was going to say, because mine it's is actually... Quite the recovery there. Buddy. Mine is Jason. and Well, bet that didn't offend you, did it? I was being folksy. Oh, folksy. No, What's no. that? No, you did not offend me yeah, at see? all. Yeah, Beth has a sense of humor. Uh, Jake is a very common name now for, for kids, but it was not when I was younger, for certain. All right, here we go. Uh, Elias Diaz hit a two-run home run in the top of the eighth to give the National League a 3-2 win in last night's All-Star game in Seattle. Who was the last Colorado Rocky to win All-Star MVP honors? Was it Larry Walker, Vinny Castilla, Juan Pierre, or last night was the first time that somebody from Colorado has been the All-Star game MVP? Last night. Look at that. All right, Beth, number two here. Diaz played parts of five seasons of the Indianapolis Indians. Name the last former Indianapolis Indian, just before you graduated from Warren Central, to win the MLB All-Star Game MVP award. Was it A, Garrett Cole, B, Dave Concepcion, C, Andres Galarraga, or D, Ken Griffey Sr.? Mm, Andres? Hold on with that name. You want, <laughs> you want another guess at that? Cole, Concepcion, or Griffey? Oh. I say Concepcion. I say nice. Right. Beth, how old is Jake, by the way? 27. Okay, so was he also a Warren Central guy? No, he was not. He was a Franklin Central Flash. Okay. <laughs> he used to always try and mimic Andres Galarraga in the batter's box back in the day. He used to love that. Uh, question number three. The National League won the All-Star Game for the first time since 2012. Who was the most valuable player of that All-Star Game? Was it Pablo Sandoval, Buster Posey, David Fries, or Melky Cabrera? I'll tell you, it's the guy whose name most sounds like it would be a candy bar. The last one, Melky Cabrera. <laughs> Whatever he said. Yeah, I just got that out of the vending machine, actually. <laughs> That's right. The buck 75 for those, which is weird. Outrageous. All right, number four. Four here, Beth. Name the only current Major League Baseball team that has never hosted the All-Star Game. It's a bit surprising to me. Uh, A, the Tampa Bay Rays. B, the Miami Marlins. C, the Toronto Blue Jays. Or D, the Arizona Diamondbacks. Hmm. Toronto. That's an excellent guess. I'm gonna. You ever been to Toronto, Beth? I have not. Okay. I'll be there uh, Friday. What's today? Wednesday? The day after tomorrow. Okay, happy 44th birthday to Disco Demolition Night. On this day in 1979, the Chicago White Sox blew up a huge box in center field that contained thousands of disco albums. The pyrotechnics took place uh, between games when they did this of a doubleheader, and the field caused damage. It went crazy. Everybody was drunk. People wearing Lee jeans were dropping out of the stands. It was a complete, <laughs> it was a complete bleep show. Name the White Sox opponent on Disco Demolition Night. Was it the Cleveland Indians, the Texas Rangers, the Warren Central Warriors, or the Detroit Tigers? <laughs> um, I'm going to go with Tigers. Nice. Look now, Beth, Beth, did you like disco? Be honest. You, disco would have been like phasing itself out when you were like in fifth, fourth, fifth, sixth grade. Oh, USA. I, remember, I, like, I yeah, definitely liked it. Yeah, yeah, you did. You, you skated to some pop music at the USA Skating Rink on the east side, didn't you? I did. And roller cave at that. <laughs> uh-huh. Beth, great effort. Congrats on the tickets. I thought there were some moments there that you were going to go five for five. You did get four of the five correct. Beth, did you ever go to Boogie Mountain? I did. On Shadlin? <laughs> Heck yeah. Did you ever wonder why we had skin abrasions when we were actually sliding down concrete? <laughs> 
<laughs> like Boogie Mountain sounds a little dicey. <laughs> Trust me. Yeah, there could was... be some Dave Concepcion happening at Boogie <laughs> yeah. Mountain. Uh huh. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. Neosporin was prime after a visit to Boogie Mountain. Uh, me. Number four. This surprises me a little bit. The only current Major League Baseball team that's never hosted the All Star Game. The Toronto did in '91. The Miami Marlins in 2017. The Diamondbacks in 2011. But the Tampa Bay Rays. Never host. You blew it! Does that surprise you, though, given Beth, the state of their stadium? Did you ever go to the Paramount Music Palace, Beth? Oh, yeah. I'm an East Sider, baby. Oh, I, <laughs> uh, I could tell. I mean, but you didn't have to be an East Sider to go to Boogie Mountain, trust me. That that oh, slick yeah. painted concrete drove from all over. Uh, but, yes, yeah, Paramount Music Palace. Oh, yeah. Beth, congrats. Thank you for the call. I'll certainly stay on the line. I, you know, Mark, to your point, I guess maybe it's not the most shocking thing given the. Stadium, but I don't know. I just figured that climate. I, I I don't know. Maybe maybe it makes sense to me. You know, have you have you seen Tropicana Field? Oh yeah, it looks awful. When you drive past it, like it's, mm-hmm. it looks like it's like slanted. I, it's kind of like cool a looking on the outside. It does look like a spaceship. I, Tampa Bay. If I'm not mistaken, though, what is the stat? Like the Tropicana Field is one of very few places to have hosted a World Series and a Final Four. The Metrodome is one. I don't know how many others there would be that have hosted a World Series and a Final Four. Yeah, I, I can't think of many off the top of my head. That was a solid effort by Beth, though. Yes, thank you, Beth, for calling. Congrats on the tickets. We'll do it one final time here. Kevin Corey.
Query on 93.5 and 107.5. The Fan. Just a couple of minutes away from uh, Chris That's Eubanks. Disco. The final American male left in Wimbledon taking the court for his quarterfinal match. Jake, it's a pretty wild story. Uh, he was never ranked top 100 in the world until earlier this year. He actually had started to do some commentary on the side, really? thinking that his career was over. 27 years old, so I know it's not super old, but obviously in professional tennis, I mean, that's you know a little bit on the elder side, especially when you haven't really broken through just yet. And I think we mentioned this yesterday. He been pretty public about how much he's hated grass courts in his career and was texting Kim Kleister as a major winner about, you know, what do I need to kind of get over this mental hurdle of, with the grass courts and everything. And clearly it's worked as now he is in the final eight here and he'll try and pull off another upset with Daniil Medvedev, a Russian, well, coming up here in a few minutes. What sport do you think has the most mental aspect to it individual sport I, I guess really tennis and, and golf are the two that I'm thinking of or maybe hitting in baseball but where a, either a mental hurdle puts you into an, a slump you can't come back from or you get into a mental zone where everything just falls into place for you yeah I mean I'm a little biased but I would certainly say golf I mean I'm sure tennis has that sort of feel but I would venture to guess golf. You know, I think in tennis you can kind of, if you want to, Jake, you can stay away from your weaknesses as best you can. Like if I wanted to just serve and then try to hit a bunch of forehands, obviously my opponent's going to try to get to my backhand. Right. But you could try and do that. Golf, you know, at some point you're going to have to chip. At some point you're going to have to putt. At some point you're going to have to hit a bunker shot. Like you can't really avoid avoid it, I think to the degree that you can in tennis. But I think both of them are so mental, and, you know, as it is with, obviously, individual sports, it's not like you can be benched. It's not like you can be taken out. It's not like you can sub yourself out, take a breather. you got to be out there, and you got to figure out adversity and ups and downs. And Eubank said it, I thought, really well the other day. In tennis, you don't have to be perfect all the way through a match. There are moments where you've got to be, but, you know, in his case, I think he had a five-setter last time out. I mean, you lost two sets there. I mean, obviously, for those two sets, you weren't at your best. But in those moments when you have an, a, an ability to try and take advantage of winning a set, you've got to be really good. And he's certainly been that with a big serve, six seven guy. You that know, helped him out. I have said this before, and I will say it a hundred times again. If you were able to get, and I do think it probably is pretty dependent upon where you are seated. But if you're able to sit down low in really good seats, Kevin, there are a few things in sports to me that are more awesome to watch than high-level tennis. I mean, it is amazing. Just the reaction time alone of the athletes is incredible. I mean, it really is amazing what they're able to do. Now, where the RCA championships used to be, I saw Greg Raystraw tweet out a picture. That is just kind of barren grass right now. Nothing is on that. You know, that's a good question. I was wondering about, it's been so long since I've gone over there, the the, the tennis center, which actually held a, a lot of concerts in the early 80s. And I guess what would be the exact coordinate, uh, like streetwise, of, of, of where we're looking? Boy, Scotty, you want to help out with that? Right behind the natatorium, right? Basically right behind where the natatorium so is. So you're looking at Michigan and or New York? What is that? I'd have to... Look it up real quick. I I know that somebody somebody called me randomly a couple of weeks ago and said, "Hey, can you settle a debate that my husband and I've been having forever?" And I said, "Well, that sounds dangerous, but I'll try." And they said, "No, I'm not. Jake is not my son." <laughs> That's right. They said, "Can you verify that there were?" The woman said, "I have a very clear memory of seeing Hall and Oates at like at the tennis the tennis center in Indianapolis." And I'm like, "100 percent, yes." They had a whole series of concerts in like 83, 84. Hall and Oates came through there. I think like Billy Idol played there. Uh, I mean, it was it was definitely a thing. So it looks like between New York and Wabash Street if you're over on IEPY's campus. Yeah, that sounds right. Um, again, it was right behind basically it, just to the west of where the zoo is is the easiest way to say it. A little bit to the north, but just to the west of where the... But Rake, and I guess we'll ask Rake on Friday, he was acting like now something's going to be there. Is this, you know, uh, uh, 
I, I shouldn't say an IUPUI expansion because now the university is being split into two, but are we getting an on-campus arena there? That's not the jungle? Yes, I, I think that's, well, I don't know if would that's it where there? it would be, but I know that um, kind of well off the radar, as we talked about at the time, there was a legislation passed for the appropriation of, I believe, an $85 million arena for IEPUI that, that would assume be for basketball, yes. And a rebrand with nicknames and, and the whole whole shebang? Yeah, the, listen, the one question that I still have about this with IEPUI now becoming Indiana University, Indianapolis, and Purdue University, Indianapolis, and if you are taking classes from one, you know they're, they're totally separate now. So if you were an IUPUI basketball player who's a freshman right now that had been taking a per- Purdue curriculum and you're still on path for that, can you not play for Indiana University, Indianapolis? Because those classes now that you're taking are a totally different school. I'd like to think they'd carry that out through the end of your, you know, four years on I, campus. I would think. I would think. but And that's – do they just become – like in the NCAA tournament or, or within the, the – are they just – IU Indy is that what it's right? Or IU, IU Indianapolis is where the athletic programs will be. Correct. I, based, I don't Correct. know is the right term, but yeah, I, I have no idea what they will eventually be called. Is Matt Crenshaw still the coach over there? He is. So obviously some footing, much needed for the basketball program over there. We'll we'll talk with Ray coming up a little bit later in the week on that. Thank you to Will Haskett. Thank you to Will Carroll as well. It is a steamy Wednesday again from a viewing standpoint. If you're looking for something on the lunch break. The Fever, they are playing at noon over at Gamebridge Fieldhouse against the Liberty. The Pacers back in action for Summer League game number three. No veterans, no Benedict Mather and Isaiah Jackson and Andrew Nemhard. A 7.30 tonight against the Thunder. Everybody have a great Wednesday. We'll chat with you tomorrow. Kevin Aquari signing off, 93.5 on a 7.50.